here is the um, case transformation. And then here is the um, precise definition of the gauge invariant operator, which is, can be defined for each on shell cross-ring vertex operator. But intuitively, um, just gluing left half of the open string and the right half of the open string together, and you insert this uh, on shell cross-ring vertex operator at the open string midpoint. So these gauge invariant operators have an interesting origin in open closed string field theory. Uh, one parameter family of formulation of, for open closed bosonic string field theory were constructed by Barton Triebach in this paper. And it was actually may not be this paper, but well, constructed. And it was observed in this paper that in a singular limit, the action reduces to that of the cubic open boson extended field theory, I just show you, with an additional vertex, which coupled one off shell open string and one on shell cross link field. Here, phi is the on shell cross link field, and j phi is a map from a cross link field to an open string field. The kinetic term of the cross link field, cross -link field is absent in the limit. So the resulting theory is no longer open closed string field theory. It is open string field theory with source term for a set of gauge invariant operators I just introduced. So if you expand closed string field this way, it, it, this is precisely the source term for the gauge invariant operator. And you can show the gauge invariance of the action with this source term um, by using these two properties of J5. An important consequence from this relation of the gauge invariant operators and open cross link field theory is that Feynman diagrams of correlation function of the gauge invariant operators are given by Riemann surfaces containing holes with bulk punctures. And the modular space of such Riemann surfaces is covered. This is guaranteed by open cross construction from open cross string field theory. So now let us consider the theory on n coincident D plane. So if we evaluate correlation functions of the gauge invariant operator in the one over n expansion, by construction, it reproduces the cross-string perturbation theory is holding the worksheet I mentioned before. So, so this one over expansion reproduces this kind of worksheet. And then under the function of the equivalence to the um, uh, worksheet on a different background, such as ADS5 plus S5 with that hold, uh, you can see this is actually the closing expansion. So let me come back. So I think to consider open string field theory as a theory before taking the low energy limit can be a promising way for proving the ADS UT correspondence and for defining closed string theory non perturbatively because we can keep track of the worksheet picture in the, in the limit. So if you're interested in this story, you can see my talk last year in Florence for further details. Here is um, my slide, to a link to the, my slide, and here is a link to my uh, video. Um, of course, we need to extend the whole discussion to open super theory. Um, but then as um, you may, as, as some of you may know that we, we are having in a very impressive development of the construction of the action of um, super string field theory. So I think it's, con it's time to study open super string field theory in this context. On the other hand, I, I also think it is interesting to consider uh, gauge invariant operators open bosonic string field theory in the non-critical string or in the topological string. Actually, these are subjects I wanted to discuss uh, in this workshop, if I were in Brazil. Okay, so this is the end of the introduction, and then let me go on to the um, the effective action for massive field. The construction of the low energy effective action of string field theory was discussed by Ashok Sen in the context of uh, closed super string field theory in this paper. The string field projected onto the massive sector is used to describe the low energy 
effective action, it has shown that the gauge invariance of the low energy theory is inherited from the, the gauge invariance of the original theory. And that we can use the same strategy to the um, open bosonic stem field theory. And I'm going to consider the action, including the source term for the gauge invariant operator. Uh, however, uh, in the case of open bosonic stem field theory, we can integrate out massive fields only classically because the existence of tachyons um, makes the uh, quantization formal. But one puzzling feature regarding this um, gauge invariant operator is in our context is that they depend linearly on the open swimming field. The, the gauge invariant operator, as I explained, is a linear function of um, open swimming field. Now, for example, the energy momentum tensor is a typical example of the gauge invariant operator we consider in the ADS theory correspondence. But the gauge invariant operators, open bosonic stem field theory, don't look like um, the familiar energy momentum tensor. So I will demonstrate that the nonlinear dependence on the open swimming field is actually generated in the process of integrating out massive fields. And although our discussion is in the bosonic theory and the classical, the mechanism um, of the generating nonlinear dependence can be easily understood in terms of Feynman diagram. So I would expect the same, same mechanism will work in the quantum theory with the super string case. So then let us denote the uh, projection operator onto the mass sector by P. And I'm going to use the uh, string field satisfying this condition. Now, the effective action for massless fields, either in terms of the string field satisfying this condition, is given by this. So, this is a kinetic term and the cubic term, but then um, action up to cubic term is not gauge invariant anymore. So, we need a correction. And then we can show that this quartic vertex, quartic interaction, um, with this quartic interaction, and then gauge invariance can be recovered. And this <coughs> interaction can be understood this way. So um, we, have, we have two cubic vertices and contracted with the um, propagator for the massive field. So this is the origin of this quartic interaction. <coughs> you can show that the action is invariant up to order g squared and the gauge transformation given this, given like this. And then um, <clears throat> I'm gonna use the, the, uh, this um, propagator for massive fields appears frequently in this talk, so I'm gonna denote it by H. So now let us incorporate the uh, source term into this discussion. So here is the action uh, with an, a source term for the gauge invariant operator. So I introduced the parameter kappa to count the power of the source so, so that to make it make the counting simpler. So let's add this coupling to the effective action of the massive field I just wrote this way. But then the the action is no longer gauge invariant and we need a correction. So in this case we need this term. And this term can be, again, understood in terms of Feynman diagram. So I had a source term and a cubic vertex. So if you contract these vertices by propagator for massive field, you can get this um, term. <clears throat> oh, by the way, this generates, this is a nonlinear, this depends nonlinearly on open sonic field, right? So this way uh, we can generate uh, nonlinear dependence on open, open string field. So this is good. Um, the gener uh, gener generation of nonlinear dependence of the gauge invariant operators on the open string field is what we expected. But there's an unexpected thing as well. So which is the um, <clears throat> this um, gauge transformation has to be modified or the kappa this way. And furthermore, the gauge invariance requires terms which are nonlinear with respect to the sources. 
So, um, I mean, the action also, we need an action of order kappa squared, kappa cubed, and so on. And the gauge transformation is also modified similarly. So I will not show you the express expression of this term in the action and this term in the um, um, gauge, trans gauge transformation. But then um, and the, these are, we have explicitly uh, calculated. And um, for example, uh, this term, F31, is given by Feynman diagram like this. So one source and two cubic vertices, and these are the propagators for massive field. But actually, there are some similarities between terms in the action, effective action, and terms in the gauge transformation. So uh, terms in this triangle have some similarities with um, terms in these no, 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 terms in this triangle. And so we find that the effective action and the modified gauge transformation can be written in terms of the same set of multi-stream products which satisfy relations called weak and infinity relations. Actually, with insight, the original action before integration, so namely this action, has a weak infinity structure in a rather trivial fashion. And the, the weak infinity structure of the effective action can be understood as being inherited from that of the uh, original action. So let me move on to the uh, discussion of the weak infinity structure. <clears throat> so let's consider an action of this form. So this is a linear term, and this is a kinetic term. And the interaction can be written in terms of a multi-string product, P2, B3, P4, and so on. And also consider the uh, act gauge invariant gauge transformation written in terms of the same set of multi-string product, P2, B3, B4, and so on. We can show that this action is invariant under this gauge transformation if this multi-string product satisfy a set of relations called uh, infinite, weak infinity relations. By the way, in this talk, I'm gonna omit all the discussions on the cyclic properties. But here are the first few of uh, weak infinity relations. So this is a relation for B1, B2, B3, and B4. And if this zero, zero string product B0 is vanishing, we say, um, the infinity relations, which are more familiar, I think. And when the zero thing product is non vanishing, we say we can fit the relation. For example, term I mentioned before in the action, effective action, and this term I, we need it for the uh, gauge imbalance at all the kappa can be written in terms of the same one string product B11 given by this. And we can show, we can confirm that all these terms can be written in terms of the uh, same set of multi-stream products. And the um, advantage of using the star product in open string field theory is that expressions for terms in the effective action are simpler and more explicit compared to crossing field theory. However, expression for terms in the effective action become rather lengthy at higher orders, even in open bosonic field theory based on the star product. Now the uh, weak infinity structure provides us with analytic control over terms in the effective action, and we present explicit um, expression for the multi product to all orders. So there is a um, very efficient way of describing the um, weak infinity structure called co-algebra representation. Then if you didn't know the co-algebra representation, I don't think you can follow the rest of the talk, but just enjoy the flavor of this um, story. Um, so the first step to simplify the expedition is to introduce a degree, which is uh, defined by the uh, Rossmann parity plus one mod two. 
And associated with the star product, uh, we define the two string product M2. And also, I, I denote, I, I define the zero string product W0, which is minus J5. I'm going to use this M2 and the uh, W0 for the construction. And to describe the uh, weak infinity structure to all orders, it is convenient to consider um, linear operators acting on the vector space TH, which consists of um, 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 multi copies of the Hilbert space, uh, tensor products of the, uh, the n copies of the Hilbert space. <coughs> Excuse me. So now the uh, weak infinity relation this relation can be expressed compactly in terms of a linear operator m on th, which squared to zero. So this m encodes the, the information on the multi-string product. And associated with the BST operator, um, we define both phase q this way, which is called a core derivation. And for m2, um, we introduce both phase M2 this way. And for the uh, zero, I'm sorry, this is typo. So the zero string product W0, we define both phase W0. So the, um, for the action of open bosonic string field theory without introducing the source term, and that the MPT structure can be described in terms of F M given by Q plus M2. And for the action, the open bosonic string field theory, including the source term, the weak FED structure can be described by M given by Q plus M2 plus W0. Now let us consider the um, um, effective action for the matter C. So there are, we need two, uh, two new ingredients. The first one is the uh, projection operator on TH, which I denote by board phase P. This. The second one is very important, which is the board phase H, which is associated with the, uh, the propagator H for the master field. So if you are familiar with the definition of the core derivation, it is similar, but different. So we need uh, that uh, um, projection operator P on the right. Anyway, so, um, Making use of this um, P and H, the, um, we can describe the, uh, the FET structure for the FET action for massive spheres without introducing the, the source term um, by this way. Okay. Um, actually, the um, construction is not, uh, this is not a new result, and, and this must be known, well known for mathematicians. I just gave it to a physical context. And also the um, construction was also used by, um, for example, in the Matsunaga uh, last year, uh, that uh, as some, of you, some of us heard last year. So the, this is the paper. And now the uh, active action for massive spheres, including the source term for the gauge jumper operators, can be the, uh, the weak infinity structure can be described by M given by this. So basically this, you can get uh, this um, operator M by depressing M2 by M2 plus W0. So I think this is fairly compact expression. And this is, uh, that's what I meant by we have analytic control over the order expression. So let me conclude my talk with some discussion. So our discussion is motivated by the low energy limit in the context of the area theory correspondence. And we are interested in the low energy region compared to the scale determined by alpha prime of the effective action for massive steel. Now, after taking this low energy limit, the theory will be invariant under the ordinary case transformation. The invariance under the ordinary gauge transformation requires familiar constraints. And for example, the alpha prime expansion of the effective action for the gauge field of the open string takes the form of a linear combination 
of gauge invariant term. However, invariance under the ordinary gauge transformation does not constrain the coefficient in front of such gauge invariant term. On the other hand, effective action with an effective structure does not take the form of a linear combination of gauge invariant terms and the constraint from the invariance under the gauge transformation associated with the um, FET structure have a more dynamical flavor. Furthermore, the insight we learned from the analysis indicates that the correlation functions of gauge event operators are similarly constrained from a very weak FET structure before strictly taking the energy limit. And since the um, weak FET structure is closely related to the world sheet picture, I hope that the dynamics of gauge invariant operators dictated by the weak NFT structure will help us reveal quantum gravity from the open swing set. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuji, for a very interesting talk and nice talk. So we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions for Yuji. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. Do we have questions for you, G? Oh. Let me begin as others uh, uh, start with a question. Uh, you, G, how could you now find, for example, the operator in the conformal field theory dual to the graviton? Can you test this or anything like this? Uh, op operator dual to graviton? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, so in the uh, or energy limit, which must be energy momentum tensor. Right. Right. But they, so, okay, one good thing about this um, uh, formulation is that the, okay, this gauge moment operator is associated with the on shear cross ring vertex operator. Right. So the, the uh, if you're interested in the um, operator dual to the graviton, we can use graviton before taking the limit. Right, so, but don't, don't you have to get now a non-linear expression for the stress tensor in terms of the world sheet fields? Uh, so I would choose uh, this B, B of phi to be an uh, on-shell closing vertex operator. Right. And then, but as I mentioned, as I explained, this is linear function of open string field, which is very unusual. Right. But after taking in the low energy limit, the, the uh, nonlinear dependence is generated. And in the limit, I expect this is um, this reduced to the uh, ordinary energy momentum tensor. Is that something you could test at this level or already explicitly or, or not? That's not an important thing. Not explicit. Okay, not explicitly, but then if you recall the, the uh, origin of nonlinear dependence, you see, this is, um, um, for example, on the, on the uh, origin of the uh, uh, graviton um, uh, open string, open string um, coupling. And we know from the gauge invariance that the, after summing over all the terms, this covers the uh, uh, modular space of um, disk with one crossing puncture and a multi puncture on the boundary, which is the ordinary calculation of the uh, coupling of uh, graviton to the, uh, uh, of the open string field, right? Right. Yeah, so from this construction, I would expect that this is the, um, how we recover the coupling of, uh, familiar coupling in the raw energy. All right. Uh, so let's see if there's any questions at this moment uh, from our audience. Um, I don't see raised hands. Uh, I see Oliver is raising hands. Okay, Oliver, please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Hello, thanks for the nice talk. Okay. Um, I was Hi, wondering Oliver. Uh, cross fertilization there is to the S matrix approach to the open superstring effective action. So, what I mean, suppose I uh, compute massless amplitudes of the open superstring and expand an alpha prime. So how much can I learn uh, from your formalism for the tensor structure in this alpha prime expansion 
Or conversely, suppose I have control over the multi zetas in the S matrix approach. Is there some input uh, towards uh, your research line uh, from there? Um, okay, so you're talking about the information of the uh, on shell uh, scattering amplitude of the open superstring field theory, right? Open superstring. Right, right. Um, um, so, in the, for example, action itself can be um, understood from this um, approach, but then uh, and then, but the, I emphasize that the importance of the uh, gauge invariant operator of open open semi right? Uh -huh. um, I don't know how much we can um, learn from the the information on this matrix. So, so I that's why I encourage you to turn your face, to, to turn your eye to the uh, gauge invariant operator. That's the idea of my talk. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Uh, we have time for a, a, another brief question. If uh, anybody wants to say something, please raise your hands again. So uh, I think we'll stop now and thank uh, Yuji for his uh, nice opening talk at this uh, meeting. And thank you very much, Yuji. Um, thank you. We will move on now to our second talk. Um, so, uh, Hiroshige, uh, we need you to set up your um, your presentation. Yeah. There you are. Very good. Uh, can we see you as well? Um, ah, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes there, so, you, there you go. Very good. So uh, our second speaker this morning is uh, Hiroshige Kajiura. And welcome you. Uh, he's coming from Shiba University in Japan. And as it says there, he's going to be telling us about uh, open-closed uh, correspondence. So please uh, start. Welcome to Brazil. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, um, I, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this workshop. And but to, so to be honest, to be honest, uh, I don't study string field theory recently, so so. But so so this is a I think this is a good chance to uh, learn recent de development of string field theory. And can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, yes, and uh, yes. So today I will. So I will. So today. Uh, so I mainly review. Review uh, various uh, relation between homotopy algebras and uh, string field series, and uh, I also recall an open closed hom uh, correspondence uh, obtained from an open closed homotopy algebra defined by Jim Stashev and myself. And uh, then I want to talk about. I want to talk, yes, what I I was wondering about it. Then, yes, yes. And if I have time, then I also want to show you briefly what I studied recently. <laughs> then, yes, so I start from an infinity algebra and uh, so yes, an A infinity algebra is uh, a graded vector space and uh, a, a collection of multilinear maps like this, and uh, they satisfy the A infinity relation like this. So these are identities uh, obtained by summing over all possible ways 
of uh, composing n elements a1 da 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 a n uh, by two m's m here and m here uh, with appropriate signs so next so so the infinity relation for n equal one and n equal two and n equal three uh, as follows and this so this means M1 is a uh, differential. So this A and M1 form the complex. And this equation means uh, differential uh, satisfies the Leibniz rule with respect to the product, product M2. And the third, third relation, this means that uh, the product is associative up to homotopy. Yes. And uh, an infinity algebra with higher, uh, trivial higher products is called a uh, differential graded, differential graded algebra. And also, on the other hand, an infinity algebra with trivial M1 is called minimal. And I so we can construct um, we can construct construct easy example of uh, infinity algebra having non-trivial higher products, but I think I can speak skip skip this. I can so yes, I skip this. And uh, there is a notion of morphism between two infinity algebras. So it consists of uh, a collection of uh, multilinear maps like this, and they satisfy the following relations. In particular, uh, for n equal one, uh, we have, uh, so this equation turns out to be this. So this means, so the linear part, F1, F1, form the chain map between these complexes. Yes. And uh, an infinity morphism from here to here is called an infinity quasi-isomorphism uh, if this F1 is a uh, quasi-isomorphism of complexes. So quasi-isomorphism means uh, F1 induces uh, an isomorphism between the cohomologies here and here. Yes. And uh, the notion of a uh, uh, infinity quasi isomorphism uh, define a um, reason reasonable equivalence relation between infinity algebras. Then I, so we are ready to state a fundamental theorem of homotopy algebra. It is a minimal model theorem by Kadei Shibiri. And uh, so this is an important so fundamental theorem. Uh, but uh, yes, but uh, this is uh, of ten, uh, this is a particular so special case of the next uh, this for uh, this theorem called homological perturbation theory developed by these people and also Merkulov and Konsevich and Soiberman and so on. So for a given infinity algebra, and uh, so this, this, is, this is a complex and we start from, uh, we start from decomposing this complex, complex. so like this. So this iota is an inclusion. So if we identify this V and the image, image of V, then so this 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 can be regard, regarded as a subcomplex of this this complex. And we have we have a homotopy operator satisfying this equation. So this data is called an SDR 
data. And given a, an S, SDR data, then an infinity structure is induced, uh, an infinity structure on this V is induced from the original infinity algebra. And, and there, yeah, there is an explicit construction of this infinity algebra using Feynman graphs. And this is actually the Feynman graph of, in physics. So this H plays a role of homotopy, uh, no, 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 plays a role of um, propagator. This is propagator. And, uh, and uh, yes, this infinity structure M corresponds to interacting vertices in this Feynman graph. So now we are, so we, we can see some connection to field theory. Yes. So a cyclic infinity algebra, a cyclic infinity algebra is equivalent to a cyclic action like this. And the cyclic action satisfying the uh, satisfying the classical VV master equation. And I, I omit the definition of cyclicity, but I think, yes, I think, yes, you can imagine what it is. So, so this is a bracket. Uh, so this is a bracket in Yuji Okawa-san's talk. So this is, so this uh, cyclicity omega, cyclicity omega is a bracket. So yes, this is a correspondence. So we can, uh, so, and uh, this phi is uh, like, uh, like uh, open string field in bosonic open string field theory. So this, this is constructed from this A. And then, then, ah, uh, then, ah, uh, so, so, the homological perturbation theory is compatible with the cyclicity in the sense in, in the sense I explained in this paper. So 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 we obtain the induced infinity structures, in, induced cyclic cyclic infinity structure here, and this corresponds to the as uh, the tree level, tree level effective theory of S, this S. And in particular, uh, cyclic infinity minimal model correspond to the on-shell scattering amplitude of this, this action. Yes, this is a correspondence. And so far I only talk about an infinity algebra, but there are many other homotopy algebra. So this, so one is, one is an L infinity algebra. So L infinity algebra is, uh, called homotopy, homotopy D algebra, homotopy D algebra. So, so in this case, the product M2 is a skew symmetric product, and this satisfies the Jacobi identity up to homotopy instead of the associativity condition. And there, there is a notion of C infinity algebra. This is a homotopy commutative infinity algebra, but uh, this is ir irrelevant to today's talk. So I omit this. And uh, an open closed homotopy algebra is um, um, a mixture of an infinity algebra and an L infinity algebra. So at least, so. This includes an A infinity algebra and uh, an A infinity algebra. Ah, yes, the co algebra description is discussed by Eduardo. Eduardo. Yes. Then the relation of strings to string field series as follows. So there are, yes, there are uh, beautiful contraction of string field theory satisfying the VV master equation. 
by the VBAC. So uh, the classical part satisfies the classical uh, VD master equation. So, so they has the structure of cyclic homotopy algebra. Open case, A infinity, and closed case, L infinity, and open closed, open closed. Yes. Now I want to talk about an open closed correspondence. And yes, I didn't say the definition of open closed homotopy algebra, but anyway, so this includes an A infinity algebra and L infinity algebra. And then if so for, if we we have an uh, if we we have an open closed homotopy algebra, then it gives an L infinity L infinity morphism from from this L infinity algebra to the DG differential graded algebra like this. So this is defined by this. Infinity algebra. Uh, here, uh, Hock, Hock means Hock shield, and G means Gerstein Haber. So, so this is uh, the Hock shield complex with Hock shield differential D, and this is uh, this is called Gerstein Haber bracket. Yes, and this is this forms the differential graded Lie algebra. Uh, which is um, L infinity algebra with trivial higher products. Yes. So if we have, oh sorry. So if we have an, um, if we have a field theory on the world sheet, then we obtain some L infinity morphism from here to here. One typical example is the deformation quantization discussed by, uh, solved, solved by uh, Konsevich. So in this case, uh, if we consider topological string called Poisson Sigma model, then we obtain um, L infinity quasi-isomorphism from here to here. Then the deformation quantization problem is solved by this L infinity quasi-isomorphism. So, so, uh, I wonder, so, so, yes, I, so, one, I think it is interesting to consider this F in, for the usual bosonic open string field theory. So, it, this is in, an interesting question, whether F is an L infinity quasi isomorphism or not. And, uh, but in general, this F, so it is very difficult to calculate this. So I think this, this one, this, this theory may be useful, but I, I'm not sure, I, I, I didn't do it explicitly. So I'm not, uh, so yes, so, so this is a, this is a, uh, yes, this is a paper uh, which uh, appeared in the previous, Yuji Okawa-san's talk, yes, yes. So, and uh, similar, uh, so different, yes, another but uh, uh, related problem is that, uh, what is the minimal model of this DGLA? So if F is an L infinity quasi isomorphism, then this should be the on shell scattering amplitudes of three closed string. So, yes, so I think this is an interesting object. And even if this F is not an L infinity quasi isomorphism, even if this is not an L infinity, L infinity quasi isomorphism, this DGLA is still an interesting object to be studied, I think, because this is a kind of closed string theory uh, constructed from open string theory only. So I wonder, what is this? But I 
didn't do anything explicitly. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> Then I want to switch different talks. So, so topics. So now this is what I study recently. So, so this is yes, homological symmetry. Now so no now I I study this problem. So yes, and uh, homological mirror symmetry. Yeah. So this is um so there is uh mirror symmetry and uh, which is a duality between a symplectic manifold and complex manifold. And the homological mirror symmetry is a categorical version of mirror symmetry, categorical form formulation of mirror symmetry. So we consider Fukaya category on this, and uh, we consider the derived category of coherent sheaves on this space, and then we discuss whether this triangulated category is equivalent to this derived category or not. And Honsevich uh, and Soibelan uh, propose to obtain this equivalence in the following way. So apply homological perturbation theory to a DG category so that this This is uh, this forms a this is a full subcategory of Fukaya category and uh, this generates this this derived category. So so the key point is this. So key point so roughly speaking, the key point is that uh, so the Fukaya category is obtained by a minimal model of a DG category. Yes. This is a key point, so I think this is interesting. But in order to discuss this, so in order to obtain Fukaya category, we, sh we need to find an appropriate SDR data, SDR data, which is a starting, starting point of homological perturbation theory. So, yes, and the uh, I reformulated this story so that we can proceed this idea explicitly in this paper. And now I study, yes. So there are some technical difficulties, but uh, I, yes, it works for this example. And now I, uh, now I work on this case. Yes, I, yes. I finish. Yes, I stop here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, this motivating talk, uh, Hiroshige. So uh, let's see if um, we have a few questions for our speaker. Either by raising your hands or... May I, may I say one thing? Yes, please keep on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, so 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 uh, this uh, may be related to the previous Okawa-san talk, but I I'm not sure. But I think this Hochschild Hochschild complex is related to the space of gauge invariant operator. But so I think this is a relation of my talk and uh, Okawa -san, what Okawa-san did, but, but I'm, I'm not sure, but I imagine. <laughs> so, so what was the difficulty or uh, how much work is to calculate this uh, quasi-isomorphism F and wh why is it complicated? Uh, so, so I didn't say the definition, definition of open closed homotopy algebra, but uh, yes, so, so this F is, is constructed from uh, open closed interactions in this, op in this open closed homotopy algebra. So in general, in general, if we consider it, so general 
open closed string field theory, then we need to consider various open closed vertices. So I think it is very complicated. And also, so, so I think, so I think, so this may be better. <laughs> this may be better, but but another problem is that this hook should so this space is huge. This space is huge. The cohomology may be reasonable, but this space is huge. So even in the case of Witten string field theory of Witten type, this may be too complicated. So I think we need some filtration, something like level level filtration or something. So, but I didn't do it explicitly. Yes. Let's see if we have uh, other questions for our speaker. Give a few seconds more for I've been waving my hand. Okay, Jim, yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Please uh, uh, ask. <laughs> Just one comment uh, on that Hochschild complex with the Gerstenhaber bracket. The Gerstenhaber bracket is very well behaved after you pass to homology. At the chain level, it's a Poisson-like structure only up to some homotopy. In particular, the bi-derivation property of a Poisson product does not hold on the nose on the chain level, even though it behaves very nicely after you pass to cohomology. That may or may not be relevant to what's going on here. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, okay. Um, let's see if uh, anybody, uh, please uh, either raise your hand or just in speak on. Um, so I think uh, we'll uh, thank Hiroshige for his contribution to the conference. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. And uh, we'll now move to our next speaker in today's se session, uh, who is Hiroaki Matsunaga. And Hiroaki, we wish uh, you uh, share your screen now. Very good. We, we can see you now, and we want to see also you. Um, Keep your video okay. on, that would be nice. Okay, so let me start. Yeah, there you go. So one, one second. So uh, we're happy to have Hiroaki uh, speaking in this conference. Hiroaki is from the Institute of Physics in the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. And uh, as it says there, he will be speaking about the path integrals quantum a infinity structure in quantum field theory. So welcome and please go ahead. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. So today uh, I'm talking about a infinity structure of your quantum field theory. And yeah, these are my today's messages to you. First, um, I want to say that each quantum field theory uh, that has a past integral description always has own quantum uh, infinity structure. And second, the past integral always gives a morphism of such an uh, infinity structure. So the past integral preserves your uh, infinity structure of your quantum field theory. And as a result, in physics, uh, you will find that as long as your original 
quantum field theory is consistent, then all objects obtained by the path integral also have own uh, infinity or uh, infinity structure automatically. So for example, uh, effective theories or scattering amplitude or some current recursion relations or symmetry and the RG flow, all of them has an uh, infinity. And finally, as you know, string free theory is a uh, consistent UV finite theory. So it gives a typical examples to which you can apply this idea very easily. So these are uh, what I would like to tell you today. So in this talk, I will explain these meanings more precisely. So this is a plan of my talk. First, I will explain why every pass integrable quantum field theory have an infinity or an infinity structure. And then I explain why the pass integral preserves such an uh, infinity or L infinity. And after that, I consider some applications to string field theory. And before starting my talk, uh, I would like to emphasize that most of these results are a kind of patchwork of known results. So some of you may know some of them. Okay, <laughs> let me start. So just now, I told you that each quantum field theory that has a path integral description always has all uh, infinity structures. First of all, let me explain the meanings of these words, uh, such as consistent QFT or path integrable QFT or QFT that has a path integral description in my talk. That is all uh, quantum field theory solving the battering Birkowski's mass equation. So what was big V? As you may know, it is a powerful and general formalism that enable us to perform the path integral, even for gauge selling. And it is described by the geometry of odd Laplacian, which is important. So in this formalism, to define path integral of something, all Laplacian exact object must vanish and the integrand must be Laplacian closed. These are consistency, consistency condition. So then for each quantum field theory, this consistency condition gives the famous uh, BV master equation. So to have the path integral, your quantum field theory must solve this equation. So we consider QFT solving the master equation. The solution of this master equation uh, often has this form. So it includes classical action and ghost contribution. And if they exist, more higher ghost contribution. And if you consider uh, quantum field theory without gauge degree, then your master action equals to your classical action. And as usual, this master action gives a set of vertices, uh, which I like mu. So mu1 is your kinetic operator, and mu2, mu3, or mu n are all vertices. And these are multilinear maps. And for a given quantum field theory, uh, this master action is unique in some sense. And actually, this set of multilinear maps satisfies a quantum uh, infinity or uh, infinity relation, which I explained. So we consider the operator uh, shifted B with a Russian. Then it gives a kind of equations of motion, and it is given by the sum of your vertices. 
uh, as you may know. And please note that solving the master equation equals to requiring the nil potency of this operator. So, because you can quickly check. So, actually, as we see, this requirement of nil potency is nothing but the quantum of a infinity or L infinity relation. It depends on your QFT. I can see. So we can expand this need potential relation uh, like this. Yes, this relation uh, nothing but the quantum uh, infinity relation. And it may be more explicit if we use the symbol uh, like a complete basis and expand each your vertices with respect to H bar. So if you consider ordinary quantum field theory, then your space-time fields are all graded commutative. Then uh, all the input in this relation are also commutative. And then uh, some combinatorical factor arise from the commutativity of input, and this relation reduces to L infinity relation automatically, or quantum L infinity relations automatically. So let me summarize. So to have the passive integral, your QFT must solve the master equation. And solving the master equation is the same as imposing the quantum uh, infinity relation on your vertices, uh, multilinear product. So each quantum field theory has own intrinsic quantum uh, infinity or uh, infinity structure, which arise from your BV master equation, solving master equation. So this uh, infinity structure is unique as is the proper action. So let's go next topic. Now we have noticed that every quantum field theory have own quantum uh, infinity or L infinity structure. So, but you may think that why does a pass integral preserve it? Yes, so this is also because of battery in Birkowski. And it might be trivial as long as you can split your field as usual. So, as is well known, any effective action for a given quantum field theory solving the master equation also solves the master equation. Yeah, you can quickly check. So hence, your effective quantum field theory also has own quantum uh, infinity or L infinity structure. In this sense, as the integral preserves it. And actually, these properties have been well used by many, many experts. And there are many studies, uh, for example, uh, flows of exact renormalization group or realization of symmetry in ERG or some new approach combining BV and ERG. Also, there are some works based on A infinity side. Uh, for example, BJ Ricard, oh, oh, sorry, this is BG. So anyway, some recursion relations of current, gluon current, or some scattering amplitude uh, is given by, in terms of uh, infinity, very clearly. And this is studied by many, many people last year or last two last year. And also last year, I also studied the classical part of the above result and proposed how to reduce a given covariant string field theory to corresponding light constraint field theory, and which I will mention later. Okay, so now we have learned that the path integral preserves BV 
and thus you are a infinity or a infinity. So as long as your original quantum field theory is integrable, then uh, you are quantum structure or your quantum uh, infinity structure or your effective theory is uh, it's always automatic. So but you may think you may think that is there more explicit construction of such a morphism? And actually we only have it. So it, it is a final graph expansion. So the part of the pass integral gives such a morphism very, very explicitly. So in other words, Feynman graph expansion always preserves quantum uh, infinity structure or L uh, infinity structure. And uh, yeah, we noticed that the path integral gives a morphism of battery Birkovitsky, uh, like this transformation. And this transformation is often called a uh, exact renormalization group transformation by some people. And of course it is a infinity morphism. So the Feynman graph expansion of this transformation also gives a morphism. So far, so we obtained some result in terms of the master action, but of course we can also obtain corresponding result in terms of uh, infinity or L infinity more directly. And it is given by so-called homological perturbation. So yeah, by using some co-algebraic description, you can get your effective uh, infinity or corresponding morphism like this. And this homological perturbation is the same as the final graph expansion or applying a weak cell M for this transformation. So now I will skip this fact, ex explanation of this fact, but uh, it is in appendix of my slide. So, so but let me give some comment on this homological perturbation. The homological perturbation uh, can be used to obtain perturbative path integral or the Feynman graph expansion. And such a perturbation is given by uh, this sequence. In this sequence, each operator is nilpotent. So there is a perturbation connecting these nilpotent operators and such a homological perturbation gives a weak cell M or the Feynman graph expansion as a chain map of this complex. So actually it is the same, completely same as the Feynman graph expansion, but sometimes uh, homological perturbation give us more explicit construction for some quantity. So it may be useful for some quantity. Okay, so before application to string theory, let me give some comment. So in this talk, I only considered algebraic aspects. So, but now it may be <laughs> trivial to you. So however, please note that all physically important information are uh, in your complete construction of regular propagators. And you might learn it from the instanton. And in general, of course, it may be a challenging problem to solve the BV master equation for quantum field theory with finite cutoff. Yes, of course, so solving master equation for quantum field theory without cutoff is not difficult. But regular propagator will require some cut of dependence. And as I know, even for young middle type theory, we just know a one loop level result only. By, it's obtained by last year. 
And in general, your Laplacian will have cutoff dependence for, for such a theory. And then, RG flow are given by canonical transformation of your master action or morphism of your infinity. Then this flow shifts the cutoff dependence of your Laplacian. So anyway, application to string field theory is easier than other these UG divergent quantum field theory. And it is exact. So maybe string field theory may be useful to seek or to construct uh, master action for such a QFT with finite cutoff. So, but we now go to application to string field theory. So we now consider string field theory. As you know, string field theory is a consistent UV finite quantum field theory and it satisfies the master equation. So for a given master equation, we can consider the path integral like this P. Then thanks to the battery in Birkowski, the quantum uh, infinity or uh, infinity structure of your effective action is always automatic. So we have many typical example. But first, please note that your effective theory, of course, has a infinity or L infinity structure, but it is corresponding to your splitting of field because such a splitting changes the propagators. So effective action always has this form, but new prime or other more explicit construction depends on your propagators. And the typical examples are here. First, as usual, if you consider uh, IR part and the UV part, then it gives a usual Wilsonian. And if you consider on-shell part and off-shell part, then it gives a scattering amplitude and uh, is a minimal model. And third, if you consider a massless part and a massive part, it gives a manifest a infinity or a infinity effective quantum field theory with finite alpha prime. And finally, if you consider a physical part and gauge or unphysical part, then it gives a gauge removed string field theory with manifest a infinity or a infinity. And the second application is light cone reduction. Uh, this is a special choice of the last example. So it says that for a given covariant string field theory, there exists the corresponding light cone string field theory. So please recall that the BLST operator of strings has a similarity transformation. Uh, for example, for open strings, we have this form. So this symmetry transformation connects your covariant BRST operator and uh, yeah, this is the light con Hamiltonian plus some extra modes. And then it gives, or it tells you that your covariant string field uh, comes from light con string field plus some BLST cultured excitation. And then, you will get a infinity or a infinity type light constraint field theory. And in general, uh, such a light constraint theory has this form and it has two parts. The first part yeah, has the same form as your starting covariant theory. So, but the second part consists of a uh, kind of effective vertices. So, you are Right theory may have different form from your original covariant theory. And the final application is realization of symmetry 
other a infinity or l infinity. So please recall that uh, composite operators of uh, symmetry transformation, so, so generator of symmetry, survives along exact renormalization group flow uh, like this. And there is no loss of symmetry. Of, of course, uh, after a pass integral, uh, the generator takes very, very complicated form and non-linear. Um, but anyway, there is no loss of symmetry. And this is also true for our case. The relation between original symmetry, symmetry generator and the effective symmetry generator is very exact or very explicit in this case. It is given by a morphism of a infinity, uh, which was given by previous slides, like this. So, symmetry of the original quantum field theory also exists in your effective theory in terms of a infinity or L infinity. Of course, it may take more complicated and have some very highly nonlinear term. And maybe Lorentz generators in the light theory is a typical example in swing field theory. So let me summarize my talk. Uh, yeah, uh, as I showed, quantum field theory has own quantum uh, infinity or L infinity structure, and which is equivalent to solving your master equation. And the path integral preserves it. So your effective uh, infinity or L infinity is automatic. And finally, symmetry in effective quantum field theory is also encoded into the uh, infinity or uh, infinity algebra of your QFT. And oh, let me give some comment. So in this talk, we learned that QFT and A infinity are in one-to-one -one correspondence in, in the sense of Vatarin Bilkovsky. So this fact may imply that deformation of QFT and the deformation of A infinity are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So, as you may know, that is given by quantum open closed homotopy algebra or IBL infinity algebra or maybe IBA infinity algebra or something like that. So, it may be interesting to the safety people. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hiroaki, for your nice talk and broad subject that you've covered in this talk. And uh, let's see if we have uh, some questions um, over here. Anybody um, raise hand or if you want, just uh, barge in and uh, start talking. Jim, would you say something? You have to unmute yourself. Yes. <laughs> it's okay now. Uh, yes, um, major question. You emphasize the A infinity and the L infinity. Uh, yeah. At first I thought those were just sort of in parallel. In terms of your formula, would the two cases correspond to the interpretation of the higher order operations, the mu n's? You, 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 so, so you, you, you in my formula? Yeah. Uh, back up. Go back a little further. Um, you, um, is, oh, no, go back several slides earlier. Oh, um, Uh, 
Okay, where's the first place where you mentioned A infinity? Well, it's right there. Okay, so on that page, looking at that formula, mm -hmm. How can I see that as being either A infinity or L infinity? Well, uh, I think you can apply the same formula for um, algebra over modular operand. Fine. And then finally, how do you work with it so that you have both simultaneously and the open closed relation? Yes, but uh, the type of homotopy algebra will be depends on your quantum field theory. So I only uh, considered such a property coming from the BB algebra. So uh, what I should say? Go, go to your next to the last slide. Next to the last slide. This one? Um, one more? Still one more? Okay, I'm looking for something that says open closed. Go so one more. More, more, more before? Uh, a slide that says open closed toward the end. Open closed. Ah, open closed. Okay. <laughs> oh, this one. Right. Um, so interpreting either A infinity, L infinity separately is fine. Where is the open closed relation as in Hiroshi gives? Oh. Yeah. Honestly speaking, it's a little obscure for me, but. <laughs> fine, good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's um, move on, thanks. Uh, Nathan Berkowitz has a question for Hiraki. Hey, Hiraki, I have two questions. One question is, for quantum field theory, you really don't need a Lagrangian. You just need an S matrix. Can you define a BV formalism when you just have an S matrix? And the second question, uh -huh. second question is, is there some simple computation where the BV formalism is the simplest way to compute something? Okay, the answer of first question is that if you have a kind of equations of motion or Hamiltonian, then you can apply very similar formula. So, but if you don't have any such a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, then I, uh, yeah, I don't know whether we can apply this result or not. So the answer for second question uh, is that, yeah, it's, yeah, this result is yeah, actually given by some, yeah, it, it's same as a Feynman expansion and just a, alternative representation. So the only merit is it has more explicit and closed uh, form expression. So, but <laughs> yeah, I guess the difficulty is conserved. <laughs> 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 let's let's have a, another question from Junik Sangupta. Uh, he's raised his hand. Junik, please start. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, so my point is that uh, the QFT stability of the A infinity L infinity nature that is trivial as you just explained. So could you please just uh, like could you please just explain that part a bit? Uh, 
like how is this trivial nature being maintained all over the place? The, that part could you just? Oh, so, so sorry. So my, my English is not so good. So please speak slowly and plain what? Please. Okay. <laughs> uh, the okay. So it's no problem. Uh, the quantum field theory stability of the A infinity L infinity nature that you just explained. It maintains a trivial uh, nature overall, right? So, so what, what, what is the question? Can you state uh, your question? The, yeah, right. The, my point is that the trivial nature, how is this thing maintained constantly? Can you just explain on that part a bit? It's too fast for me too. Yeah, it's hard to understand the question. Maybe you should try it uh, through the chat. Uh, Junik, uh, let me uh, end up with one question I have here. Uh, the, um, if you have a quantum field theory, do you have an option to choose to do it with A infinity or with L infinity? And how do you choose? Uh, yeah, it depends on your field content. So for example, uh, first, you can consider a kind of open string field theory or a non commutative gauge theory. Then your structure becomes an infinity type. So, but then you can deform your theory by adding external fees or source term. And if such an external fees is commutative, then uh, your theory after the formation, will be mixing of A infinity and L infinity. So, option, option. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I was just noting that, for example, churn simons theory can be formulated both as either A yeah. infinity or L infinity. Uh, slight differences, but uh, they can admit both. And I, I just don't know if any field theory, you can do the same thing. Yeah, basically any L infinity appears in this form uh, can be written in terms of A infinity. Yes. And uh, yeah, if you consider commutative field, then it automatically reduces to L infinity. So, Okay. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, <laughs> I guess we'll stop now. The time is uh, um, moving fast. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Hiroaki Matsunaga, for his talk on, on this subject. Uh, we're uh, having now a coffee break. It's uh, 9.36 New York, uh, 10.36 uh, Brazil time. Uh, so we're going to take a 10 minute break, a uh, coffee break, and we'll uh, continue a, a little afterwards. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to communicate with any speaker that spoke this morning and, uh, and otherwise uh, the, the Zoom meeting continues live, so uh, we can keep using it, but uh, talks will start again with that earlier in about 10 minutes.
Um, all right. Um, so Nathan, I think we're going to restart. That's yeah. good. Good idea. Very good. Uh, so we're continuing on our morning session, first day of the conference. Uh, coffee break is over and um, time for some good talks again. And uh, we're delighted that uh, Ted Erler uh, from uh, the Prague Institute of Physics of the Czech Academy of Sciences uh, is giving us a talk, uh, continuing on some of the subjects that were spoken about in, by the first few speakers. And uh, he's gonna be telling us about the mapping of uh, Witten and light on string field theory. So Ted, would you share your screen with everybody? Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. There we go. Make yeah. it maybe it's a little bigger or yeah, that looks okay. wonderful. All right, so please uh, welcome Ted and uh, go ahead. Okay, okay, so thank you everyone for coming. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the relation between uh, Witten and light cone string field theories. This is some uh, uh, ongoing work with uh, Hiroaki. So, um, okay. Okay, so the connection between uh, covariant and light cone formulations of string theory is a really ancient uh, subject. And I wouldn't say it's completely mysterious, but I think that from the string field theory point of view, maybe uh, certain things could be uh, a little bit clearer. So uh, what, we're trying to do is find an explicit mapping between the field variables of uh, Witten's uh, string field theory and uh, the conventional light cone string field theory as originally formulated by Kaku and Kikawa based on ma the Mandelstam style uh, vertex. So the upshot of this is that uh, the light cone string field theory can be derived essentially as an effective action from covariant string field theory by integrating out the unphysical modes. So, um, so this uh, theme of effective actions is something that we're gonna see a, a lot in this conference. Uh, so this is another iteration of this idea. Um, okay, so let's uh, remind ourselves uh, what we need to know about the Witten string field theory and the light cone string field theory. So the Witten string field theory is uh, formulated with an, uh, okay, so you can write it in this way. It's a cubic action where uh, the cubic vertex is defined by uh, Witten's open string star product, the associative star product of open strings. And uh, for light cone string field theory, you have an action as well. But this time it's uh, quartic, okay. So there's the uh, there's a uh, cubic vertex describing uh, the light cone interaction of three uh, open strings, and uh, it turns out that you also need a quartic vertex, um, and uh, the the actions can be written in this way. So the string fields for these actions uh, are both elements of the state space of your boundary conformal field theory that's defining your your open string. Okay, so uh, uh, they're both uh, states at ghost number one. So for the Witten theory, uh, it's, it's an arbitrary state at ghost number one. And for the light cone theory, it's not an arbitrary state, but it's a state that's subject to a linear constraint, which is that uh, all uh, fields where there are ghost oscillators or light cone oscillators acting on the vacuum, all those fields must be zero. Okay, so there's a constraint on our field. Um, so, um, uh, so we have, uh, okay, so I'm going to say that the uh, Witten string field is an element of uh, state space H covariant and the light cone string field is an element of the state space H light cone. 
So as I was just saying, both of these state spaces are the same in the sense that they're the state spaces of your conformal field theory. But uh, I, it's useful to consider them as, as uh, different because on the covariant state space, you have a BRST structure, which is defined by the usual BRST operator. Whereas on the light cone state space, you have a BRST structure, which uh, essentially amounts to uh, C0 times L0, okay? So uh, the BRST structures are different. And one additional comment is that usually the light cone string field theory is not, the, the light cone string field is not thought of as an element of the full state space of your uh, conformal field theory, okay? Though you can embed it in some trivial way. It's just, uh, um, so you usually don't, uh, in particular, you usually don't formulate the action with the ghosts, but for our discussion, uh, it's useful to keep uh, the ghosts in the action uh, just for bookkeeping uh, purposes. And um, okay, you can get the action as it's usually written by just evaluating all the ghost correlators which are implicit in this expression. Okay, so uh, so let's first consider uh, a generic open string field theory, and um, and uh, so we won't commit about the the nature of the uh, the interactions of the string field, um, and uh, then we will um, okay we we will discuss the nature of the interactions a little bit later. So let's just keep ourselves general for the moment. Okay, so to to arrive at a uh, corresponding light cone string field theory, what we need to do is we need to integrate out the unphysical fields, okay? As I was saying, uh, okay, but unfortunately this is not quite as easy as just uh, integrating out uh, the fields that contain light cone and ghost oscillators because uh, the BRST structures in the light cone theory and in the covariant theory are not the same. Um, so in the light cone theory, what we have are states uh, that are generated by uh, uh, transverse oscillators acting on the vacuum at some momentum. So this is, uh, this is a, a basis for our, uh, for our light cone string field. And uh, uh, in the covariant state space, the equivalent object is uh, is actually created by acting uh, by an expression of this form, where this capital A I, where uh, these transverse oscillators are actually uh, the DDF operators. Okay, so we want to uh, associate a state in the light cone space like this with a state in the covariant space, which looks like this. So to integrate out the unphysical degrees of freedom, what we need to do is we need to find a decomposition of our covariant uh, vector space into the DDF vector space and a vector space that includes everything else. And these subspaces have to be uh, BPZ orthogonal, okay? And then we take our dynamical string field in the covariant theory and we write it as a sum of a DDF string field and a string field uh, which lives in, these, in this unphysical sector. And then we solve the equations of motion for the unphysical sector. So, um, so if we take, uh, so we just take the equations of motion of our theory. So again, uh, we're not going to be specific about what these uh, products are that define the vertices for the moment. But generically, the equations of motion will take this form. And okay, well, the equations of mo what we do is uh, we take the equations of motion and then we project uh, the equations of motion onto uh, uh, the unphysical space, okay? And we solve the equations of motion for psi else. So, um, so, so we have this equation of motion for psi else. And uh, it's given by one minus this projector onto the DDF subspace act, uh, uh, 
operating on uh, the nonlinear products uh, of the theory. So we we solve this equation to uh, find uh, uh, psi else is a function of psi ddf, and then we plug into the uh, we plug our solution back into the action, and we have uh, our light cone effective action. Okay. So um, so there are two problems. Okay. So the first problem is how do we uh, really understand explicitly this decomposition between the DDF states and everything else that is in our covariant space, state space. And the second problem is um, that in order to solve this equation of motion for the uh, unphysical part of the field, um, we need to fix a gauge, okay? So usually when deriving effective actions, you impose Siegel gauge, um, but this won't do in our case because, uh, um, because uh, this complementary space contains states that are in the kernel of L0. So we have to find some other way to fix the gauge and solve these equations of motion. So, um, so the resolution of this uh, technical difficulty is fairly clear uh, from the point of view of the light cone state space rather than the covariant state space. So in the light cone state space, uh, we just write it as a direct sum of uh, our physical light cone state space, which has no uh, ghost or light cone oscillators, and the states that have ghost and, and light cone oscillators. So that's what this direct sum is. And uh, these two spaces um, are distinguished by whether or not this operator, which I'm writing as L0 parallel, uh, has a uh, vanishing eigenvalue. So if this L0 parallel uh, is equal to zero, there are no ghost or uh, light cone oscillators. And if it's not equal to zero, then it does. Okay, so, um, so furthermore, it turns out that you can find an operator, which I'm going to call B0 parallel, which, satis which uh, satisfies this commutation relation. So Q light cone with a B0 parallel is equal to L0 parallel. Okay, where Q light cone is the, anal is the analog of the BRST operator on the light cone state space. Okay, so from this point of view, it's clear what we what we should do in this uh, in, in this state space. Uh, we should integrate out all the fields which have non-zero L zero parallel using the gauge condition that B zero parallel equals zero. So what we need uh, to accomplish this, uh, okay. So what we need ultimately is a similarity transformation between the light cone state space and the covariant state space, okay, which maps the BRST uh, operators into each other. So uh, Q is the ordinary BRST operator and Q light cone is the BRST operator on this light cone state space, and there should be a similarity transformation relating them, okay? Then we can uh, identify the DDF subspace, okay, basically as the image of the physical light cone sub subspace under the similarity transformation, and the, everything else uh, will be the, uh, the image of the states which contain ghost and light cone oscillators, okay? And then the gauge fixing condition we should impose is that uh, the similarity transform formed B0 parallel should be equal to zero, okay? So uh, this similarity transformation, okay, has been constructed by Isaka and Kazama uh, back in 2004. So, um, so now uh, maybe we can explain how this goes. Okay, so, so we're going to think about our uh, world sheet variables, okay, from the point of view of a covariant string and from the point of view of a light cone string. So um, from the point of view of a covariant string, okay, we have our transverse oscillators or, or transverse scalars. We have light cone oscillators and uh, zero modes, okay? And 
taken all together, these form the degrees of freedom of a C equals 26 matter conformal field theory. And then we have our BC ghosts, which have central charge minus 26, okay? So this is the usual story. Now, from the light cone point of view, we have our transverse free scalars, okay? Um, and these define a conformal field theory with central charge 24. The light cone string field also depends on the zero modes, uh, the light cone zero modes, so P plus and P minus. Okay, but it doesn't depend on the alpha plus, alpha minus, and the BC oscillators. Okay, so from the uh, light cone point of view, these other things are kind of obscure or they don't really exist. But um, presently, it's useful to think of them as basically um, defining a uh, conformal field theory with vanishing central charge with the appropriate twisting of the energy momentum tensors. And uh, in such a way that these four objects form a, uh, a, uh, a co cohomologically trivial quartet, okay? So, um, okay, so, so now let's, okay, so now that we have these different points of view on our uh, world G degrees of freedom in the covariant and the light cone point of view, uh, we can think about the energy momentum tensors, okay? So there's the usual energy momentum tensor, which is just the total matter and ghost energy momentum tensor of the conformal field theory with vanishing central charge. There's the, what I'm gonna write as T perp is the energy momentum tensor of the transverse free scalars. And it has central charge 24, 24 transverse scalars. And then uh, this, energy momentum tensor, which is kind of the non-trivial thing, is uh, well, I'm going to write it as T parallel. And it consists of uh, the light cone free bosons, the light cone coordinates at zero momentum, and then with the BC uh, ghosts, okay? But the BC ghosts have been twisted in such a way that um, the uh, the B ghost has uh, conformal dimension one and the C ghost has conformal dimension zero, okay? And in this way, this energy momentum tensor has vanishing central charge, okay? And then we could take the, uh, the transverse and longitudinal energy momentum tensors that I've defined. And if you add them, you get something called T tilde of Z, which is called, which I'm going to call the light cone energy momentum tensor. Okay. Okay, so now with this background, we could state uh, the result of, of Isaka and Kazama, which is that there is a similarity transformation relating the light cone BRST operator to the uh, covariant BRST operator, where the light cone BRST operator is this C0, L0, which we already saw in our action of the light cone string field theory, plus some other term which is a, uh, which basically cancels the, uh, in the cohomology, uh, cancels the contribution to the cohomology from the uh, ghosts and light cone oscillators through the quartet mechanism. Okay, so this is the explicit expression. And they also found that this similarity transformation can be written as an exponential, which looks like this. Okay, so this, these are the formulas. So, um, what is interesting is that this uh, similarity transformation S looks kind of like a weird conformal transformation, okay? So it turns out that it does. So if you just consider operators in your world sheet theory that have no uh, contractions with X plus, with the plus free boson, uh, then the action of this operator is in fact a conformal transformation but it's a conformal transformation computed with respect to the uh, light cone energy momentum tensor rather than a conventional energy momentum tensor. And it's defined by this conformal map, which I'm writing here as FS, which takes this form. So what is a little weird about this is that this conformal map explicitly depends on an operator in the theory, okay? And it turns out that if you, uh, think about what this conformal map is uh, 
in terms of variables on the Lorentzian world sheet, it is exactly corresponds to a diffeomorphism, which puts the uh, coordinates on the world sheet into light cone, into the uh, light cone gauge uh, parameterization. Okay, so, um, so now we have this similarity transformation and okay, what happened here? Uh, somehow I'm zoomed out. Sorry about that. Um, we have this similarity transformation and using this conformal transformation rule, we can we find that the, uh, that the similarity transformation of the alpha oscillators just gives us our DDF oscillators. And the transformation of B0 parallel, which we need for gauge fixing is given by this expression. And of L0 parallel is given by uh, this Okay, this expression, okay. Okay, so now we can solve uh, the equations of motion for, um, for uh, okay, so now we can ret return to the original problem, which was to solve the equations of motion for the unphysical part of the covariance string field. And, uh, Okay, so we do this but again by fixing the gauge uh, S B zero parallel equals zero, okay? And if you do that, then you can write the equations of motion like this, okay? The equations of motion for the unphysical field. Or this thing, which is in front of the equations, so these are just the products of the theory again, and this thing, which is in front of everything, is kind of a propagator, okay? So, um, so if we plug the, okay, so we have psi else both on the left and right hand side, but we can just plug this equation into itself to determine uh, psi else just as a function of psi DDF, okay? And this is what you find, okay? So you find, uh, okay, so there's some structure here. And then you can uh, take this solution and you can plug it back into the action, to your original action. And then you have an effective action, which depends on your light cone degrees of freedom and your light cone string field. Okay, so, so in order to write it in terms of the light cone string field, we have to remember that this DDF string field, which lives in the covariance space, is related to the light cone field by this similarity transformation. So if you do that, um, this is what you find. So you find that you have an action uh, which has the, uh, the correct uh, light cone kinetic term, and then you have a bunch of interactions, okay? And you have interactions with this propagator in it, and these correspond to effective vertices. So this uh, process that I've gone through uh, to derive this effective action can be formalized uh, using the so-called uh, homotopy transfer. Okay, the, the version I'm familiar with uh, is one version I'm familiar with was due to Martin Markle, but we'll, I think we'll be hearing much more about this at this, uh, at this conference. So, um, okay, so we have, uh, we have a, a, a consistent theory of an interacting light cone strength field with the correct kinetic term. Okay, but if you start with generic open string vertices, uh, as we were just now, uh, then the theory that you obtain is, doesn't have the light cone interactions that you're used to from, from Mandelstam and Kaku and Kikawa. Um, but you get some action which is non-polynomial and is complicated and I think is, is uh, okay, right now I don't think it's so well understood how, what this uh, action is uh, explicitly or, uh, but uh, um, so if you apply this procedure, for example, to Witten's string field theory, then you will uh, not get the conventional light cone string field theory. So uh, the question is, uh, what do you do about this? So it turns out that there is an exception to this rule that uh, you get this complicated uh, structure at the interacting level, and that's when you when your vertices in the covariant theory are defined in exactly the same way as in the conventional light cone theory. So you take your vertices 
and the covariant theory to be um, this, these Mandel stem style vertices. Okay, so this kind of string field theory was, I think, uh, as far as I know, it was considered by uh, Hugo and Zwiebach. And this theory has a very special property, which to me is uh, a little bit miraculous, which is that um, if you compute uh, this effective action from this theory, then the uh, vertices, then uh, the vertices uh, don't change. The, the, the cubic and quartic vertices do not change. And uh, the effective vertices all vanish, okay? So um, it turns out that, uh, that this only works, okay, this works uniquely with uh, the Mandelstam uh, style uh, vertices. So if you choose any other open string vertex, you will get something very complicated. Okay, so therefore the light cone string field theory that we want is, to, is obtained by integrating out the unphysical modes from this uh, kugold zwiebach theory, which has this uh, light cone style interaction. Okay, so now I think probably I'm, I'm out of time. Or I will be out you of time. can go for three more minutes. Okay, okay, so, um, Okay, so this kugold zwiebach theory, I'm calling it a covariant theory, but it's not really covariant because the, uh, the vertices, uh, the conformal transformations which define the cubic and quartic vertex depend explicitly on the minus component of the momenta. So, so we have uh, the light cone theory related to a, to a BRST invariant field theory, okay? But this is not... Uh, Witten string field theory, which is what we originally wanted. So we have to make an additional step which relates uh, the Witten theory to this kugold zwiebach theory, okay? So this can be done uh, following uh, a, uh, an idea, I think it's due to Kaku. And the idea is that you think of a theory uh, where you have a basically uh, your strings are basically light cone strings whose length is basically the minus component of a momenta. And then to these strings, you attach uh, Chan-Payton indices, okay, which are themselves strings or parts of a string, okay. So, um, so this parameter lambda gives the length of this Chan-Payton index. And then you just consider the conventional uh, interaction, light cone style interaction, and you just have to make sure to contract the chan Payton indices. And this gives you, for example, a cubic vertex that looks like this, okay? So you could, if you cut off these pink regions, you will find that this is actually just the conventional Mandelstam uh, diagram, okay? So um, in this way, you can define uh, products M2 lambda and M3 lambda, which, which depend on this parameter lambda, which is the length of this chan Payton strip. And if you take lambda to zero, you find the kugold zwiebach theory or with the conventional light cone vertices. And if you take the limit lambda goes to infinity so that these strips become infinitely long, you obtain Witten's string field theory, okay? So, uh, okay, so now you have a one parameter family of vertices which, can, which relate the uh, Witten theory and the light cone vertices. And basically through a well-known procedure, you can, uh, you can use this uh, deformation to construct an infinitesimal field redefinition, which, which uh, changes uh, between the vertices for different lambda. And by integrating this infinitesimal field redefinition, you will be able to write the string field of the Witten's string field theory in terms of that of the kugold zwiebach theory. And then by integrating out the unphysical fields, then you will be able to relate the Witten string field to the conventional light cone string field. Okay, so that's all. Very good. Uh, thanks very much, Ted, for your talk. Uh, uh, let's see if we, we have a three, four minutes for questions. Uh, anybody raising their hands or just uh, or unmuting yourselves and uh, beginning a question? Ishibashi has a talk. Uh, 
a question, please uh, get started. You should, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, it's very interesting, but, but I have one question. Uh, Kugos Vivac theory, if you uh, start from open string, you should also include uh, closed strings, right? Uh, and so uh, I was, I was uh, confused. Uh, can you, uh, can you relate that to the uh, Witten's theory uh, with only open strings? That's, that's very well, mysterious. I think you can consider just uh, uh, tree level light cone open string field theory. Uh -huh, uh -huh, string uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I see. Very good. We'll have a question from Ezra. Uh, Ezra. Hello. Oh, hey, um, hey, welcome. Could you, could you step back in your slides one, I think one slide or maybe two? Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, that's a pretty hairy integral, the domain going from zero to infinity. Uh, so what kind of states do you know that are in the domain of the operator? Uh, well, I didn't really try to explain to you what this integral is, but it's really an expression that should be understood on the tensor co-algebra. But do you, I mean, are there uh, vectors, do you have like a dense set of vectors in the Hilbert space on which G is defined? Uh, I don't know, that's too deep a question for me. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, if, yes, uh, okay, I think in order to get to these kind of uh, issues, I would have to really explain this co-algebra formalism and the infinity algebras and then Maybe. Well, you, but the thing is that if the domain of this operator is actually not very large, then the theories aren't going to be equivalent. I mean, if this is purely a formal construction, then we're not going to see that the two Hilbert spaces are really related. So well, I was this thinking, operator you have that some, I'm writing capital G. Yeah, it's an operator that acts on the tensor algebra of open string state spaces, and even one copy of the open string state space is not really a Hilbert space. In fact, it's not really defined rigorously as a, oh. it's an infinite dimensional vector space that. Uh, so you're is, paying no attention to how the norms of vectors are increasing in the sums of tensor. You're more or less looking at formal uh, tensor series, not convergent. Well, tensor. I'm looking for, I wish I could, answer your question at that deeper level, but uh, okay, what I'm looking for is formulas. And uh, those formulas, okay, you can evaluate them to give numbers. And if you get numbers that are finite and make sense, then, which I believe you will find sensible numbers from these formulas, then you don't worry about it. And if there are numbers that don't make sense, then uh, okay, then you uh, did something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> But uh, that, that has to be checked. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to our next question by Ivo. Ivo, please go ahead. Hi, Ted. So, Hi. Uh, yeah, my question was, so going from Witten's theory to uh, Zwiebach, Kugo Zwiebach theory, and then going finally to the Lycon theory, is that all homotopy transfer? So each, each, is each step a homotopy transfer in, in the usual sense? Uh, so the first one step is the a, a infinity isomorphism. The first step from the Witten theory to the kugold zwiebach is A infinity isomorphism. And the next step is a homotopy transfer, which is a, a, a quasi isomorphism. All right. Okay, thank you. Very good. Shi Yin, uh, hello, welcome. Hi. Uh, have a qu your question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, about the status of extending this procedure to the superstring case. As to un understand the superstring case, the Lycombe, uh, you might encounter some spurious singularities when the vertices collide. Uh, yes. do, do you understand how that's reflected in this procedure? This is part of the motivation for why I'm studying this. Uh, so I don't know what happens because I haven't even finished this project, <laughs> but, but this is the next thing. Uh, so. I could say the general expectation, which is that what you could do is you could start with a kugold zwiebach theory, and then you have to think about how to input, put PCOs in your vertices, okay? So I think what the story will be that unless you put this PCO at the interaction point, that when you integrate out the unphysical fields, you will 
get a very complicated and novel non-polynomial light cone string field theory. And so, um, but you don't, but perhaps that can be dealt with. Okay, so that's my hope that that theory can be understood and you can calculate with it. And then you could understand uh, from this point of view how to resolve these uh, issues with operator collisions in the superstring. Very good. Uh, I, I want to add a, a, a comment. Uh, indeed, when at that time, when Ku and I were working on this, there was the uh, Japanese group HIKO that yes. were working with an unphysical length parameter, and that gave extra infinities. Uh, and Professor Kugo, in fact, uh, had thought about how to fix that with this uh, version we presented there. So much of the work was done by him, in fact, in trying to find an alternative to Hiko. And uh, uh, he, he decided to write it with me on this appendix. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's a consistent theory uh, that seems it's nice to see that it, it works out to do something useful. So thanks very much, uh, Ted, for this uh, very uh, motivating talk and for all these results that uh, sound very interesting. Uh, Martin? Yeah. Uh, I can't, Jim, I can't, okay. Yeah, well, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Apparently there's a button somewhere. <laughs> yes. Case, I was about to do it precisely to mention uh, Hata, Ito, Kugo, Kuritomo, and Ogawa. The fact that that M3 has a very nice pictorial description and uh, Theodore, is there a clear correspondence between the HECO version and your M3 or the M3? Uh, yes, so it, the HECO version, uh, so in, in the HECO theory, your string field depends on an, on an additional parameter, which is often right. called alpha. So in this theory, this kugo Zwiebach theory, this alpha is just taken to be a physical parameter which is the minus component of the momentum of your state. Uh, okay, so uh, in that sense, uh, it's just a question of what you're calling this parameter alpha. So uh, the vertices have exactly the same geometry um, in either case. Fine. So I'll Hello. go back and look at Kugo Tsuibak again. I must have done it uh, decades ago. <laughs> Um, I think because of time, uh, I'll have to stop now and we'll go on to our next speaker. We thank Ted again for his talk. And now we're going to welcome Harold Urban from Turin University, Italy, uh, INFN and Alessandria. And um, Harold will be uh, speaking on algebraic structures of effective field theory. Uh, I can see Harold, you're up in the screen, so uh, would like to see your face, if possible. Your... Um, yes, I'm yes, uh, perfect. On. Okay. So welcome, and um, let's uh, go ahead. Listen. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk. So we speak on algebraic structure of effective string field theory, which um, will be, which is a work in a collaboration with Cargo Macaferi, Martin Schnabel, and Jakub Boschmera. And it will be very related to other talks uh, we have heard today, and I think uh, we'll hear uh, writers in particular by Yuji and uh, Hiroaki. Um, so the motivation is first to compute effective action from string field theory. So in particular, to understand better the low energy limit uh, of string theory um, to match with, uh, I mean, the real world. But, and to do this, we want to understand the general structure uh, using A infinity and L infinity algebra. And we are particularly interested in three aspects here. So the first is to keep the massless fields at finite momentum, to compute a higher derivative correction, uh, and finally to include the L wood invariant. And there is two approaches. So the first is perturbative. So you just work with uh, the usual uh, formulation of string field theory, which is quite intuitive, but it's quite cumbersome beyond the lowest orders. But it's much more direct to understand what is happening. So it's good to start with this to see what is the general, uh, I mean, get a hint of the structure. 
And then we can move to a coalgebra language to make a statement at our order. And other advantage is that it gives a natural basis for your string field to work with. And it also gives you easy way to work with deformation thanks to the homological perturbation lemma. Um, so here are some reference uh, on various aspects. And as I said, in particular, you can see talks from uh, Hiroaki, Jacobs, and uh, Yuji. And so we start with a perturbative description to give a taste of why we were uh, going in this direction and what were the main questions we wanted to address. So you take H to be the Hilbert space of string states and Psi is a string field. So it's a general uh, um, combination of states in H. And you can write the action and equation of motion in this simple form, uh, both for A infinity and infinity. So you have the kinetic term and you have a potential and the equation of motion, you can write it in this formal way where V prime is related to V in this way. Um, and let me say that I'm working only at the classical level in all this talk. So you have an inner product on H and uh, the BRST charge, which is also the L1 product. And in the case of L infinity potential, so you have the, the potential is a sum of uh, Ln product, which are uh, taking n state in H and give you, giving you another state in H. And so, and you have a gauge invariant. So your action is gauge invariant. And this is translated by the fact that the Ln satisfies the L infinity relation. So things which are well known to everyone and reviewed in the other talks. So what we want to do here is to introduce a projector P, which satisfies this property. So it should commute with L0, Q, and B0, be safe adjoint. And it should also uh, contain the kernel of L0 hat. So uh, this describes the massless states. And then I will speak about light states, which are in the kernel of, uh, in the image of P, and heavy states, which are in the orthogonal uh, space. So the simplest example, which uh, later we focus on, is the project on massless states. So as the old hat, you can understand it as the mass of your states. And so we want to consider states, uh, to keep only states which have zero mass. So we will integrate out all the other states. And the procedure to get the effective action for the right fields, it's first to uh, do a gauge fixing of the heavy field. So we we'll use Seagull gauge in this part. Then we, we can integrate out the heavy fields, check that the out of single gauge constraints are satisfied, and then integrate out the right auxiliary fields, so the Nakanashi out of fields. So you need to get fixed to invert the kinetic term. And the, so to do the procedure first, you can introduce the single gauge projector, pi s, and you can decompose the field in three pieces. So the first is the right field, and then you have the heavy field, which you decompose in the Seagull gauge, uh, I mean Seagull and out of Seagull component. And in order to find the equation of motion as for each of the fields, you use this uh, well-known decomposition of the BRST charge. So where you decompose it according to the ghost zero mode. And you get the three equation of motion. So for the right field and for the heavy field in the Seagull and out of Seagull component. And so now what you want to do is to use this equation to integrate out the heavy field. So first, you impose the single gauge for the heavy field. So it amounts to set this air uh, up to zero. And you get the, you get the gauge fixed equation of motion, um, so which are given just in terms of phi and air rho. So this uh, psi gauge fix is just phi plus air uh, done. And the next step is um, to solve the second equation to get R done in terms of phi. So to do this, you introduce the single gauge uh, propagator, B0 over L0. And by setting the equation of motion for R done to zero, then you can write R done equal, so the propagators times um, the gradient of the potential. And here you note that you still have air done in the right hand side. So you will need to resolve this iteratively to get an expression just for air done in terms of phi. And the important point is that when you look at this, so L0 here in principle can be singular when acting on the right hand side. So for example, when you have on states. 
So it just says that uh, we are working with an effective series. So you want to have a momentum cutoff uh, so that you, the momentum will not go higher than the minimal uh, mass. So, so here, uh, if you divide F0 hat by alpha prime, we get the mass. So you want to get k squared below the um, lowest mass of the particle you're integrating out, so which is just standard uh, effective theory. And um, OK, so now the question is uh, out of Siegel gauge constraints, so which are like the Gauss constraint in electromagnetism. So we have this equation of motion for the air up. But when we set air up to zero, we still get this equation, which is non, not uh, identically zero. And the point is that you cannot derive this from the effective action. So the point is that you must impose this equation on the side. So as is well known uh, when you get fixed. And what we found is that uh, it automatically holds if the right equation of motion holds. So it's interesting because now for, the, uh, for your effective action, you don't have to keep track of this constraint because you know that it will be automatically satisfied when you solve the right equation of motion. Um, so, so this will be something simpler that you don't have to care about. Um, so here, um, so it's uh, just a very simple reminder of how you can get the solution if you're interested for explicit details. So you uh, expand the field in, uh, in terms of a small parameter mu. And then you can solve order by order in mu and resum. And so for R done, you get something uh, which reminds you the, like what you found in your talk, for example. So where the R done is given by uh, the L2 product of two right fields, and then you have the propagator, and you continue like this at high order. And if you plug this in the effective action, uh, you see that you get an effective interaction, which is giving um, where you have two cubic vertices related by a propagator uh, of uh, heavy fields. And the point is that in many interesting cases for the super thing, you can compute uh, these terms with localization. And, the, and for this, I will report you to Jakub's talk uh, of tomorrow. Um, you also have an effective gauge invariant. So you can write the equation of motion in terms of effective L infinity product. So if you started with L infinity, or you can do it also with A infinity. And you get an effective L infinity structure. So the first two products are just the uh, uh, original product projected uh, with P. And then starting from the third product, you get corrections. Uh, to this. And then you can check that this is indeed the infinity structure. And you also have a gauge invariance of your effective action, uh, which is given in terms of this effective product. So now you can imagine that here it's quite easy to do it uh, up to third order, but if you want to go to high order, it will, be, it will become uh, quickly complicated. So it's why we will need to find a simpler approach uh, to, to this question. OK, so now what we want to do is to, um, to consider a massless gauge field. So, so just to, to fix the idea, we focus on the open bosonic string. And to, to discuss what happened with the auxiliary massless fields. So, L0, so, we, so the, um, the fields in the kernel of L0 hat at Gauss number one. So you have two states. So the first is what distributes the gauge field. So it's the usual. Uh, uh, I del x uh, times the uh, I exponential of I k x. And then you have a second uh, state which describes the Nakanashi Rotrop B field B. And so what you note here is that so A mu k is a gauge field and it's primary if k dot A is zero, so if uh, it's uh, transverse, and it's on shelf for k, k square equals zero. And so the field will be physical if both conditions uh, are satisfied. Then the Nakanishi Eutrop uh, field is not primary. And it's also uh, what uh, Ashok spoke about uh, last week when he was speaking about the ghost zero mode. And so now the first things you could do would be to impose the single gauge condition and the constraint to get rid of this Nakanishi Eutrop field. So you find that the single gauge condition and the uh, out of Siegel constraint gives you these two conditions. So you set B to zero and A become transverse 
and then primary. But you don't want to do this because you want to keep the gauge invariance. So in that case, you need to integrate out the Nakanashi Gautrop key. So you have two ways to do it. So the first uh, way is to directly integrate out B. So the way you do it is to again use the, the Siegel uh, gauge, uh, the Siegel projector. So you apply it to the, mass, uh, the right equation of motion and you get an equation for phi B. So here, what is easier in that case compared to the previous case is that the kinetic term of phi B is uh, algebraic. So you can just invert it easily using the SU11 algebra uh, where N plus appeared in the decomposition of the B arrested charge and N hat ghost is a ghost number without zero modes. So you can invert this and find an expression for phi B and plug this back in the action. So if you just look at the free action before integrating out the Nakanashi Gautrop field, you find this action and you directly see that the, um, so the Nakanashi Gautrop field is linear in the gauge field. So, but here you have several, um, I mean, you can do it, but it's not the simplest things you can do. So you have a better approach, which is to first use the field redefinition to make the state uh, with the gauge field primary. So instead of looking at phi, phi A, you look at this modified phi A fields where you shift it by the KMU uh, times del C. And then you redefine your Nakanashi Gautrop field to have beta, which is B minus this K dot A. And so first it's interesting because your state for uh, containing MU is primary. So even if you're off shell and so on, it's still primary. So it will simplify computation using MU. And the point, so, so okay, you can in, um, implement this with a modified projector pi, uh, which, which happens this way. And um, we will see later using co-algebra how you can characterize this projector. And you see also that the free action has a nice form because uh, mu is directly the gauge uh, covariant action. And you have beta, which is uh, just appearing as beta square. And in particular, if you want to solve for the Nakanashi Gautrop field, you see that it, start, it starts quadratic in uh, the gauge field. So, so then this it, it simplifies uh, the computation of the action because you know that you don't have to take, I mean, the correction due to the Nakanashi Gautrop field will, will appear at a higher order than in the previous case. And later, so when I, uh, I will come back to this from the quadgebra language, you will see that uh, the quadgebra gives you this modified approach instead of the previous one. Okay, so now I can go to the quadgebra description. So you have many advantages uh, using the co-algebra. So the first is that you don't really need to decompose the field explicitly. So you can just work with your projectors and work with the final fields you get after all the projections. So you don't have to keep track of uh, all the components at the intermediate step. Um, you also find the optimal projector uh, very easily. So by this, I mean that uh, in that case, you find the projector pi instead of pi uh, Siegel. You can package the perturbative expansion and the effective interaction um, so, so that you can just uh, do computation at all orders and extract uh, order by order the product you need. Uh, in particular, you can read the effective infinity structure also very easily. And more interestingly, so it's uh, two things we studied uh, here in the paper to come, is how to perform two projections at the same time. So first, uh, integrating out the heavy fields, and then the Nakanashi Gautrop fields. And then how to have two, um, uh, I mean, to, to have both a deformation, for example, by the Elwood invariant, combined also with the projection to get the effective action. And so here I will mention three applications. So the first is uh, how to get the effective action for gauge and, and uh, Nakanashi Gautrop fields, so, which is something very uh, well known. And then I will explain how you can um, use this, mo uh, this extension of uh, the standard uh, computation of the effective action, effective action to get uh, the effective action just for the gauge field. And then what happens when you get also the Elwood invariant. So um, 
the co-algebra description is the following. So first, instead of start using H, you will consider the tensor product Hilbert space TH. So where you take just uh, the tensor sum of all the tensor product of H. And you also define this proje projector where you, you take, I mean, you map, uh, I mean, you go from the tensor algebra to the chi po uh, tensor power of H. Then the code, you can embed the A infinity product as co derivation on TH. So if you take the MN as the A infinity product, um, so you can define co derivation which go from TH to TH as follows. So the simplest way to, to define them is to just start by applying with a projection on the Hilbert um, uh, space uh, to the power N. So it's basically just you get um, the identity on a certain number of fields. Then you apply MN on N fields, and then you apply again the identity of the remaining fields. Um, and then you can package all the A infinity relation in this simple uh, square bracket. You will also need to use group like elements. So if A is a element of H, then the group like element is just the sum of one plus A plus A to the power two and so on. So it's the sum of all the tensor product of a given state. And finally, you have the symplectic form omega, which is just a generalization of the uh, BPZ product. And using this co-algebra description, uh, you can rewrite the action in this very simple form. So you need to introduce, so here is, you, you introduce an interpolation of your string fields. So where psi of one is psi and psi of zero is zero. Then you have this derivative uh, to which you can again associate a co-derivation. And here you see, so this uh, plays the roles of the psi we had in the first entry of the symplectic product. And here this M applied on the group like element, we, we generate you the sum of all the interaction. Then you can very easily write the equation of motion and the gauge transformation. Okay, so the point here is that you, um, the way I say it is we, I mean, I, it's not really the, uh, mathematically rigorous the way I present it, but the point is we really just to package all the equations so that you can extract uh, what you want to compute more easily than writing uh, all the terms in your action uh, as we are doing in the perturbative approach. So now you can encode the free string theory as a strong deformation retract. Um, so where the vector space is a tensor uh, product, uh, is a tensor, uh, algebra of H. The differential is a BRST charge Q. You have the contracting operator, which is the free pro propagator delta. So, so the, you define also um, an object acting on the tensor algebra as UG was showing in his talk. And then you have a projector P. Now you want to describe the interaction as a perturbation of this uh, object. And so it's a perturbation, you write it as delta M, which is the sum of all the interaction MN for N greater than two. And you get a new differential, which is the sum of the previous free differential, so the BST charge plus all the interaction. You get a contracting homot homotopy operator for this M and you get another projector. And I will show you a diagram on the next slide for this. And you get some condition on all this subject. Um, and in particular, you can describe the gauge fixing as your contracting operator applied to the field equal to zero. And it must also satisfy the hodge codera decomposition, so where the commutator of Q and delta should be one minus your projector. And then you get additional equations. Harold, you have about two or three more minutes. And... OK. Um, so OK, so here it's, uh, you can uh, summarize the diagram in this way. So, here you start with your free theory and you get a projector to your effective free theory. And here you have perturbation to get the, um, so the interacting theory and the effective interacting theory. And the point of the homological perturbation lemma is to give you the expression of the perturbation of your effective theory of the full contracting homotopy operator and of this projector P in terms of the data you had introduced before. So your deformation here 
and object you had in this quadrant. So it's where you get everything from this data. Um, okay, so here it was already explained before, so I will skip. So now what we're interesting is to combine two projections. So first uh, to integrate out the heavy fields, for example, and then to integrate out the Nakanashi top fields. And what we found is that it's, um, you can summer, squeeze this diagram by removing what was happening in the middle by just combining the two, two projection in only one projector. And then um, you can also get a combined propagator here. So now if you apply this to the Nakanashiro trope fields, uh, first, uh, so you integrate every field and Nakanashiro trope, and the hodge condera decomposition for pi zero Q fixes the pi and delta two. So here now, if you compare with the expression I had uh, earlier in the first part, you recover this propagator C0 M minus. And in fact, what you found is that you get a modified projector. So it's a single gauge pro projector uh, minus another contribution. So you are willing using this uh, uh, phi tilde A and phi beta uh, parametrization of the states. And the point is that now, when you look at your effective action just for the field, so the gauge field A, you find that you have an effective uh, propagator with a second term, so which is algebraic. And here you can match this with the algebraic um, propagator due to the NA field, which appears in the work, work of uh, Ashok, which he explained last week. Um, so now very briefly, I will go to the second uh, application. So here it's what we call the vertical composition. So here we want to apply two deformation. So for example, first you add interaction, then you apply, you add the Elwood invariant. So in that case, we found that you can again squeeze the diagram by forgetting about what happens in the middle and summarizing this by a deformation where you do both deformation at the same time. And again, using the homological perturbation lemma, you can write all the objects appearing here from the object in this quadrant. And the application here is to the Elwood invariant, which you described in great details. So in particular, we found that you can introduce an effective invariant for the effective theory here. Um, so you can also uh, use it to deform the effective action. So if you start from the uh, original action deformed by the Elwood invariant, you integrate the heavy fields to get an effective action. It's the same as deforming the effective action by this effective invariant. Um, okay, so here it was very good. So, um, so now, so when you apply this vertical composition here, you can get the effective action in, in the presence of the wood invariant. And you can very neatly um, uh, summarize the effective product uh, thanks to the homological perturbation lemma. And in particular, it implements automatically the vacuum shift of the product due to the fact that uh, the Elwood invariant is a tadpole in the original reaction. And you can also read very easily all the end order products uh, in this way. And so I will conclude. So here what we, were, we found is an efficient way to combine multiple projection and perturbation. Uh, we also understood better the role of the nakanashi trop field and we studied the effective action in the presence of the Elwood's invariant. And so now, currently, we are trying to compute the quartic effective interaction, including all the alpha prime corrections for Witten's SFT. And we would be interested in generalizing, generalizing this to the open closed string victory and to compute the gauss dilaton uh, contribution. And thank you for your attention. Very, very good, uh, Harold. Thanks for your talk. Uh, uh, we're a little short on time, but uh, still have a couple of minutes for uh, some questions. If uh, anybody raises their hand, we'll take care. Esra, I think you have a question there. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't lower my hand. I don't okay. <laughs> no question. No effective. Um, uh, Harold, your subsequent projections must all commute with each other or not? Um, 
like the product of two projectors is not a projector unless they commute, I think. Yeah, I think they should commute, uh, yes. And that happens with an initial outlook fields. Yes, because, um, yeah, here you, you look at the, I mean, the Nakanesho outlook, it's, um, I, as you see, you had this um, C0 insertion in the projector uh, right. here. Yes. So this what makes these pro uh, properties to hold. So because here it's just the pi s, so obviously it will commute uh, with itself, and then this c zero will uh, cons uh, coincide with the c zero of the pi s. Let's see. Um, let's see if there's any other questions at this moment. Uh, Andre, uh, go ahead. Andre, uh, we don't hear you very well. Um, uh, maybe problem is, can you hear me now? We hear something. How do you hear, Harold? No, uh, not very. Very badly. I, very bad. Well, it's a small question, so maybe I'll ask later. By... Yeah, you can ask by chat, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, Harold, you removed your slides? Yes, so it's because I was not seeing the chat, so I was thinking it could uh, yeah. the chat, but... Uh, um, let's see. Um, any, any more questions? All right, so we'll um, thank Harold again for his talk. The, matches very interestingly with all the previous talks that uh, have considered related questions. And uh, now we have a, a little bit of time for a break. Uh, it will have to be short, however, because I've been told by uh, Nathan that we have to finish by 1 p.m. Uh, Brazil time or 12 noon uh, by New York time. So uh, we will restart in five minutes uh, with a talk from Matesh Kurtra, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks to all the speakers so far, and we'll uh, take a tiny little five minute break.
Okay. Matej, uh, how are Hello. you? I'm fine. Please uh, share your screen, put it up. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. That, that looks very good. All right. So uh, this is the last part of this uh, Monday session of the conference. So we have two more speakers, uh, each one speaking for 25 minutes, five minutes for questions. We should be done by 1 p.m. Brazil time, uh, Sao Paulo time. And uh, we're uh, happy to have... Uh, Discussion by Matej, uh, who's coming from uh, Czech Republic, and he will speak about uh, SU2WZW model solutions in string field theory. Um, so please go ahead. We're all listening. Okay, so I would like to thank the organizers for allow me, allowing me to speak here. So as, as Barton said, I was talk about a project which I started long ago and now I finally returned to it to finish it. And it's about SU2 as a mean of written model solutions in string field theory. So why, why are we concerned with this model? So first of all, it's, it's a test of open string field theory on some more complicated background which doesn't involve just the free boson or the Verazero minimal models but it also has a potential to tell us something interesting about this model. So as you know, the open string field solutions are conjectured to describe boundary states, which means that we can observe transitions between different boundary states. And as I'm show, going to show later, there seems to be some interesting selection rules, which are tell us which conventional boundary states can be found from others, and this could tell us something about the RG flow in the boundary theory. And another thing we can try to do is to search for non-conventional boundary states, which are unknown and thus, thus we find new theories. So some work about this was done by Michishita long ago, but it's, it's very simple and it doesn't involve many things that I'm discussing here now. Okay, so since this is very technically complicated, I will have to skip most of the details because I don't have enough time for that. So I will focus on presentations of results. So I will briefly say only a few words about string field theory. So I'm working with the traditional bosonic open string field theory, which is the usual cubic action. I use the level truncation approach, which is a numerical approach, and I use the Siegel gauge. This study is quite complicated, so it means that I am not able to reach very high levels, and the precision of result is much, much lower than, for example, in case of the free boson, but still it's good enough good enough to identify most, most solutions and tell us something interesting. So I will review a few basic information about the SU2 Vesumino written model. So if you look at the SU2 group and the group elements can be parameterized, uh, for example, by three angles and they, uh, they look like this. This is quite complicated, but later it will simplify to just one angle. So these elements are generated by three operators. I'm conventionally using these J plus minus operators and G3. And if we go to the SU2 Vesumino return model, these operators are lifted to currents and they have this well-known mode algebra. Okay. Next, there are the primary fields in this model. So these primary fields have similar structure as irreducible SU2 representations, which means that they are labeled by two half integers j and m. But there is a difference that the 
a range of j is restricted by the level k of the Vesuvino Witten model, so the j goes from 0 to k half, but m has the usual range. So if we look at how the currents act on these primary fields, then we find that the zero modes act in the usual way as we know for the SU2 groups and positive modes annihilate these primary operators. So the Hilbert space is spun by these states, which means uh, creation operators with different upper indices. But I will talk a bit more about boundary states in the Vesumino Witten model because that's what we are trying to find. So I will distinguish two types of boundary states. First of all, there are the traditional boundary states which preserve half of the bulk symmetry, which means that they satisfy the going condition of this form, where this omega is a joint representation of some SU2 element G, which means that these boundary states are labeled by SU2 group elements, and also by half integer j, which has the same label as primary operators. So for a given g, we find those, the usual card dissolution, uh, which can be written in terms of S matrix. So we have this familiar term, and these are Ishibashi states for the given group element. And the second group of boundary states are symmetry breaking boundary states which in general satisfy only the Virazoro gluing condition, and most of them are not understood. Okay, so if now shortly let's go back to open string field theory, where I'm going to impose this, this kind of condition, which means that this operator J03 acting on string field Psi is equal to zero. And I'm imposing this condition in order to fix this SU2 symmetry of solutions because otherwise I would have such continuous symmetry and it would be impossible to solve the equations numerically. So when I impose this condition, it greatly simplifies many formulas. Out of the three parameters which parameterize the group, only the parameter theta survives. Its range is from minus pi to pi, and for example, the group's elements look only like this, and all irreducible representations also become diagonal. This matrix also is diagonal, and so on. So everything becomes much simpler. Now, the Cardi boundary states are associated with SU2 conjugacy, conjugacy classes, which form either points where j equals zero or k half, or two spheres on the SU2-3 sphere. And if, if we consider only the brains which preserve the j3 going condition, oh, okay, I, I didn't say that, but uh, this formula implies that we preserve the going condition for j3, so only the conditions for j plus and j minus can be change by, uh, by our solution. So if, if we consider these the brains of boundary states, then we can nicely draw them on a circle. So here we have, have a figure where brains with theta equal to zero are denoted by black color. So sh I show all of them. So these are these lines. And then if we have brains with non-zero theta, uh, then they are rotated by this angle. So there are a few red lines and points which denotes these d brains. You can also notice that there is a symmetry between j and theta and k half minus j and theta minus, minus pi, which is given by rotation of the circle by half of its length. Okay. Next, let's have a look what kind of observables we have in string field theory. So I will consider the energy which is derived from the open string field theory action. Then there are elwood invariants, which are labeled by bulk primary operators. So we have this formula. 
here that this is a bulk operator and you notice that in principle these two labels can be different but because i impose the the j3 condition then these two labels have need to have the opposite sign so we have just two labels for these primary operators and invariants so the, this invariants should give us the bo corresponding boundary states and the expected value looks like this so we have some sign these are the boundary states coefficients which are given by the s matrix and here is some complex phase involves involving this angle angle theta so invariants with the same j should have the same absolute value but they can differ by complex phase and finally i will show uh, the first out of Siegel equation, which serves as a consistency check when we should go to zero. So I will start by showing a few regular solutions, which are solutions which describe the Cardi boundary states. Okay, in the examples that I'm going to show, I will be working with k equal 4 and the initial boundary condition j equal 1. And I found uh, three groups of solutions which are real, which in this context mean that they satisfy such condition for elute invariants. Determining the reality just from the string field is difficult because string field can be real only up to now states, which is, isn't easy to check. Okay, so if in this particular case, I've managed to go to level 11, 11 which it's much lower in, than in case of, for example, the free boson when I got to level 18. And to reduce the amount of that I am showing, I will show only infinite level extrapolations and then comparison with the expected values. So I will start with, with this solution. So here, first, as I will look at the energy, and we see that. It, nicely corresponds to this value which is energy of one half brain okay next you know i can have a look at the invariants and we see that they are nicely symmetric up to some let's say complex phase or or sign so the solution is real it, it, the important point is this invariant which is real and since, since this invariant has some generic dependence on the angle theta and it's real that means that we can determine this angle exactly and in this case we find that the angle is equal to pi over four and we can check that all the other invariants are consistent with the expected values it also satisfies uh, this out of Siegel equation so it's a nice regular solution we find three more solutions with the same energy and which uh, are related by rotation. I will show a figure later, but none of these solution has theta equal zero, which is kind of strange, which because that is the basic value which we would expect, but we don't see it. Okay. Next is a solution which corresponds to a zero brain. So once again, we have we can see a very nice agreement of the energy and of many of the out invariants. Once again, that we find that the invariants are either real or purely imaginary. So we, we can determine that the angle is equal to pi over two. And we have one other solutions with angle equal minus pi over, pi over two. Okay. And finally, there is a third real solution. So in this case, we find that there is much lower convergence and the precision is not very good. So if you look, for example, at the energy, you can see it differs from the expected value already at the second place, while here we have agreement like for, for the decimal places. It all probably also represents a zero brain, like the previous solution, but it's much less precise. So there is some chance that it's, it is some exotic solution which breaks the symmetry, but it's, I think that it has good enough agreement with the zero brain. And this solution has theta equal zero and there's another with theta equal pi. Okay, so let me go here. 
So this is the figure of order of solution which, which I have shown you here. So this black line is the deep brain I have started from. These four lines for, represent the first solution, these two points, the second solution, and the last solution is represented by these two points. So and if, if we go to other K, we find similar solutions which also have angles equal to some nice and nice of multiples of pi. And therefore we can formulate some selection rules which tell us which theta can be found. So the well convergent solution uh, satisfy the property that this angle is proportional to the difference between the initial and final label of the boundary state. So it's 2 pi over k times this difference plus a possible sign. Now also usually, unless we start with the D-brain, which is exactly in the middle, then the brains tend to be on the same half of the circle. So if, if we draw a picture regarding this rule, we find this. So this is the initial D-brain and all the others touch it at, at one point and they form, they form nice, I don't know how to call it. it it's a, such kind of a net. This example is for k equal nine. Okay, and if, if we consider also the solutions which have worse convergence, which is like the last one which I have sh shown, then the rule generalizes to this, where we add some integer to this difference. In this case, the figure looks like this. Here you have four points like this, and all of them are connected by lines. I'm not exactly sure what's the meaning of the figure, but really it's, it's a nice structure. Okay, so next I'll skip to other type of solutions which are SL2C solutions. So the SL2C group is a complexification of SU2. So we can see such solutions if we uh, leave the reality condition and which we allow solutions which are complex. So when we want to describe such boundary state, we generalize this angle by giving it an imaginary part. So I write it like this. I have some I have logarithm of rho so that this exponential gives uh, contains rho to the nth power. Therefore, invariants which have a uh, high projection of the spin m have either high or large values because they have such powers. Okay. So the the angle theta seems to follow the similar rule as before, but the other parameter which we find seems to be quite generic. Okay, I'll show one example, which is at k equal to, and it represents a zero brain. In this case, we can see all, once again pi over k. In this case, uh, this rho equals approximately two. So when we look at the invariance of the solutions, Solution, we find that they are no longer symmetric. We see that the absolute value of this invariant is, for example, much bigger than this one. And it's approximately four times higher, four times higher which is this parameter squared. And once again, we find that this, this number is four times this, which is four times this. Okay. We also notice that although the solution doesn't satisfy the reality condition, then it it has real action, so I call it pseudo real. When we look at the string field, we also find that it excites the marginal field, which is given by uh, J3 minus one, but it, it, this field has imaginary value. So it's kind of a imaginary marginal deformation. And finally, I will get to exotic solutions which satisfy some unknown boundary states. So in this case, we find solutions which break the going condition for J plus and J minus, but due to the ansatz we have for the string field, they still present. Sorry?
Did that, did that hand some of this? Just go ahead. Okay, I, I don't hear. Okay. Well, in this model, we found of only a relatively small number of uh, well behaved exotic solutions, at least when compared when the, with the free boson on Taurus. And these solution, solutions appear mainly if we consider boundary still boundary states with high J, which means with high initial energy. And sometimes we also find so solutions which have similar energy, which could be related by marginal deformation. So I'll show one example later. Okay, so the first solutions we find is for K equals three and J equal one half. So it starts as a complex, but it becomes quickly real at level four. So if, if we look at it, we also find that it's highly symmetric because many of these invariants have exactly the same values, for example, this one or this one and this one. And we find that it's probably physical because it satisfies this out of Siegel equation. Okay. In this case, we can actually predict what are going to be the exact values of this invariants because it's related to, uh, to a similar solution in M equal five minimum model because we have this type of decomposition of the of the, the SU two three model, so it's M equal five minimum model times three boson. So in this case, we should be able to find the boundary states analytically, but it's not so easy because this model doesn't have factorized uh, partition function. Okay. And finally, I'll show two solutions at k equal four, which have similar properties. So if I skip like this, you can see that they have almost exactly the same energy. We find that many Elwood invariants are exactly zero or approximately zero. So they are, and the only non-zero ones are these which have m equal zero and these two. And if we go to the other solution, it has very similar solution properties, but it differs by this invariant. So in this case, these invariants are the same. So the solution are real. And in this case, this invariant is much higher than this one. So the solution is only pseudo real. Okay, so how much of this I said? Okay, they're the same energy. Okay, so the second solution is kind of similar to a SL2C solution, which I have shown before, so it's likely that it can be obtained by by some complex marginal deformation of the first one. So we can find such interesting relations. Okay, so I'm, I guess I'm approaching the end, so let me summarize. So we find three solutions which represent the Cardi boundary states, which follow such kind of selection rule regarding the angle theta. And it would be interesting to find by some BCFT methods whether we can see similar results from BCFT RG flows. Okay. Interesting question is whether we can reach other angles than these which are given by this rule. So an approach which seems to be quite promising and which I'm working on is to use kind of combination of relevant and marginal deformations, which means that I fix the value of the margin of field for a given value, like as we do in the marginal deformation, but I'm looking for solution which decreases the energy. So this seems to work at least to some extent, but it's not exactly yet clear to me how much of the modulized space can be covered in this way. Okay. So, the second type of solution which I set up pseudo real solutions which represent SL2C boundary states, which follow similar rules for theta but not for the other parameter rho. And finally, we find exotic boundaries, exotic solutions which de describe symmetry breaking boundary states. It's not exactly clear why we see only a small number of these solutions. So one thing it couldn't be, could be connected to a slow number of relevant operators. Second possibility that is that boundary states which break the 
glowing condition can have, can have much higher energy than the initial boundary state. And the other possibility I'm considering is, is that this condition which I imposed is too restrictive. So another other option which one could try to fix the SU2 symmetry just by some Z2 subgroups of SU2, but the problem is that this is not compatible with the, with the J plus minus operator, so one would have to use other answers from the string field, so this would be more difficult to do. And this could be next project. Okay, and finally there are some analytic results regarding some symmetric brown symmetric breaking boundary states in the SU2 Vasominovit model, which are these two references. So it could be interesting to try to compare uh, the boundary states and see if there is some agreement or not. So this is all and thank you very much for listening to me. All right, thanks very much for your talk, Matt. Uh, so uh, we have uh, three minutes for Questions to Mate. Hey, Macaferi, please, uh, Carlo, go ahead. Hey, okay. So, uh, do you also find uh, uh, higher energy solutions in, in this way to know it and open circuit theory? Oh, yeah, you can also find some solutions. I, I didn't show anyone any here because they are usually worse properties, but if you Consider, for example, the simplest case, which is k equal to. So this is related to, to the Ising model, and do you find exactly the same higher energy? Oh, I see. I see. I see. In the Ising model, I see. You can find, but, of course, some others, but this is the simplest example. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Good. We have any other question? At this moment. How would you hope to relate your exotic solutions to the analytic work? Is there, like you have lists that compare well or what are you gonna do to do that? Mm, well, it would be necessary to, it would be necessary to compare the boundary states, but it's not so easy because it's written in a, in a quite different formalism. So it, yeah, I guess you would really have to, uh, uh, work out what are the lowest level of states and let's say by doing some OP or uh, some similar approach really to write up down a map between the states and then you could compare the coefficients but it would be quite a lot of work I think. The only thing that could be uh, related is the energy. I see. Okay, any Additional questions on matter? Very good. So thank you very much for the talk uh, and those interesting new solutions. And uh, we're going to move to the last uh, speaker in this uh, first day of the conference. Uh, he is Jim Stashev, uh, well known to all of us for his work on A infinity, homotopy algebras, L infinity, all those infinity structures. And uh, welcome, him. Please, uh, Jim, could you share your screen? And get sure. Uh, maybe you here somewhere. There we go. Let's see. Not quite yet. Oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good thing you asked. Yes. No, that's not it. What am I supposed well, to that do? That green button that, in the bottom that says share screen. Yeah, that's, that's what I hit and this strange thing came up. Let me try again. Share screen. Your code. Oh, okay. There it is. That's my desktop. I got to get to the right thing for my talk. Great. I don't think we see you yet, uh, but uh, oh. you can see me, but you can't see my screen. That's correct. Yes, there we're making progress. 
there's a very busy desktop. <laughs> okay. Yes, unfortunately. Hold on while I get something more appropriate up there. Um, get this out of the way. There we go. How's that? Good. Can you see it? It's cool. Is that me or somebody? Oh, okay. okay. It's still. Open. Okay, now I gotta get this out of the way. All right, so very good. So this is our last talk of the morning uh, for the next uh, 25 better. minutes we're happy to hear jim stasher from upenn and unc and he will tell us about uh, the formations obstructions and higher structures in gauge field theory take it away jim <laughs> okay before i get into these many topics uh just to say it is amazing to me when I first did A Infinity and tried to have it published, it was rejected on the basis that it was totally self contained and of no interest, even within mathematics. Uh, you proved me wrong. There are so many names here today that I don't even know your work. I look forward to learning more about it. But let me get on with my talk. So, in physics, of most of you, almost all of you must know this, so I'll be very quick specifying what a field theory is. But my point of putting fields in quotes is that quite often you people don't say what your fields are, they're just symbols. Similarly, a gauge field theory is presented as having a group of local symmetries. The local is very important because it means that the gauge group acts as fiber-preserving morphisms. Think of the corresponding infinitesimals as vertical vector fields. The designation gauge transformation refers to the infinitesimal action of G on the fields. But here's the history of L infinity in physics, really somewhat surprising. Because of the way it was expressed, the L infinity formalism came later, but the actual concept was buried in disguise. Even in the early work of Doria and Frey, they uh, described a free differential algebra. Turned out that's uh, not the way a mathematician would say it. First of all, it was a differential graded commutative algebra but it was free only if you ignore the differential, a crucial difference. Life got really interesting in 1984 when my physics colleague, Hank Van Dam, had a visit from a Dutch student. He was uh, helping supervise at the time, Carrot Burgers, and they were working on higher spin fields. Garrett started to tell me about it and I said, oh, and you mean the next term looks like this? And he said, yes. I was very suspicious there was an L infinity algebra hiding there and later uh, with Fulp and Lada, we in fact found that was the case. The year before actually, Batalin, Fradkin, Vilkovsky for the Hamiltonian version, and Vitaly Bilkovsky for the Lagrangian version, constructed a differential graded commutative algebra, though they didn't say it that way. And lo and behold, after perusing it for quite a while, I realized again, there was an L infinity structure there. But what really brought L infinity into the physics community was Barton's closed string field theory talk at the last gut workshop, which just fortuitously happened to be at UNC Chapel Hill. I raced over from my son's commencement at Duke and came back just in time to hear Zwiebach 
And lo and behold, there it was again, essentially an L infinity algebra. By the way, the disguise problem is also true in mathematics. The L infinity algebras were hiding in Sullivan's uh, minimal models for rational homotopy types. And on the other hand, they were first made explicit in my work with Mike Schlesinger on deformation theory of rational homotopy types. By the way, Giovanni Felder was my colleague at Carolina for a little while. In light of today's pandemic, I think you might appreciate this quote. Since then, it is indeed expanded to ec epidemic proportions in field theory in two major ways. First of all, as description of a physical problem is then interpreted as an L infinity algebra. Burgers, Behrens, and Van Dam were for higher spin algebras. Uh, you all know Barton's work, and I just mentioned BFE and BV. On the other hand, recently there has been recognition that maybe L infinity algebras were a way to organize generalized gauge field theory. By the way, if I'm talking too fast, let me know. I can always cut the end of the talk. <clears throat> In particular, the suggestion is that every classical perturbative gauge theory, everything you want to know about it, could be encapsulated in an L infinity algebra. Again, field dependence was the key idea. It began in Burgess, Behrens, and Van Dam, but keep it appearing now. Apparently at that time when they first did it, it was novel. Now everybody seems to take it for granted. So just in case you've been listening to these talks about L infinity without anybody reminding you what they really are, they're just a generalization of DG Lie algebras. That is, you had a graded vector space with a def differential. Differential means square zero, and then a coherent set of generalized brackets. In particular, the first one is just the internal differential. And coherent means satisfying generalized Jacobi identities. If you're not familiar with them, it wouldn't help for me to display them. On the other hand, they can be incorporated in a much simpler, simpler formalism. There is an analog of the chevalet eilenberg cochain algebra, which would look the same as it would for a differential graded Lie algebra until you look at the differential. That is, I've expressed this in a mathematical formula, linear maps from the free graded commutative co-algebra on L. Another way of saying that, and this was in the early days of chevrolet eilenberg cohomology, as alternating multilinear functions from L to itself. But of course, in the infinity case, you use all the possibly infinite number of brackets as part of the differential. In physics, the generators of that algebra were dubbed ghosts. The differential was called BRST. The equivalence with uh, Chevalier-Annenberg was only realized later. All three of these have their individual advantages. But the co-algebra formulation is particularly useful for defining L infinity morphisms. Notice, even of strict DG Lie algebras, it turns out that you do not want to limit yourself to strict DG Lie morphisms. And of course, that was key in Kinsevich's proof of formality. Okay, the batalin vilkovsky complex deals with variational problems, typically Euler-Lagrange, but there's an issue that Kuryanov and I have been discussing about when it's not of a Lagrange form. 
Anyway, the key thing is that there are symmetries, gauge transformations, which form a group with an infinitesimally algebra. This is the same group and the algebra I talked about early on. So here's what they do. They start with the Lagrangian in terms of fields, definitely thought of as sections of some bundle here. To make sense of the, um, or the Lagrange equations, you really want to go to a jet extension and then use the algebra of local functions on the jet space. Then the Lagrangian problem has a solution which corresponds to a shell. Notice I'm beginning to learn how to speak physics. A shell sigma contained in the jet space. Precisely that a function is a solution if and only if its jet extension lies in the shell sigma. The corresponding algebra for sigma is the quotient of those local functions modulo the ideal, the stationary ideal of those functions which vanish on shell. So what they did, not that they knew they were doing this, absolutely brilliant, they adjoined generators of various degrees to form the Kazul Tate resolution for this quotient. Actually, in the very special case, Kazul was good enough. But it was clear that physics demanded going further. Heno came to visit Carolina, and talking to him, it was clear that the Tate extension of Kazul was needed. On the other hand, they adjoined ghosts to form the chevalier eilenberg complex I mentioned earlier. And with the differential, now we're looking at not values in the Lie algebra itself, but rather uh, as a module, well, excuse me, with values in the module over the L infinity algebra. Their method was mimicking Thurston walking on two feet. That is introducing not the whole Kazul Tate part and then the whole Chevrolet Allen part, but rather introducing a new variable and its anti-variable corresponding to those two pieces. And this gave an odd Poisson bracket, odd because there's this shift in degree that I'll talk about more later. For example, you start off with a, a field and an anti-field. Then you have a ghost and an anti-ghost. And so it goes, step by step. Unfortunately, the total does not square to zero because the structure constants you're used to are now structure functions. Batalin and Vilkovsky in the Lagrangian setting, and Batalin and Fradkin and Vilkovsky in the Hamiltonian set, setting, thought to add a sequence of terms of higher order. So you start out with the Chevrolet Eilenberg and the KT, and they don't square to zero. So there's, you kill the discrepancy, defining, adding new variables so as to kill the discrepancy and that's your D1. But then there still doesn't square to zero, so you repeat the process. On the other hand, we have this idea of using L infinity algebras as an organizing principle. This has become popular just in the last, oh, maybe two years. Perturbative gauge theory, including its dynamics, can be organized using an L infinity structure. A significant part of the story is again allowing field dependent gauge transformation, going back to Berger's, Barrows, and Van Dam. But now apparently just assumes that's a reasonable thing to do. In particular, Holm and Barton, Olaf Holm and Barton 
began investigating L infinity structures of general theories, paying attention to the gauge parameters, the gauge fields, and the equations of motion. And they began to build this differential graded vector space, the differential going from x n to x n plus one. By the way, they, I think, went the other way, used negative degrees and had a differential going down, but this is my choice. In particular, that differential from a field to an equation is dependent on the theory. That's the equation, uh, for example, the Euler-Lagrange equation. They emphasized the terms of higher order in A. They knew it should be there. So they had the gauge transformations and the gauge algebra. That is to say, the algebra of the gauge transformations. Do not believe those signs and rational coefficients. Uh, there are some different conventions and one always has to watch out. Oh, which I should have mentioned, by the way, in that L infinity situation, I just mentioned that you could write it with a differential going up or a differential going down. There are also two conventions as to the change in degree. One is the old fashioned L infinity algebra and the other is a sufficient uh, shifted version. And then adding the field equations, which had not appeared in uh, explicitly in Burgers, Behrens, and Van Dam. Yurchko, Raspolini, Seaman, and Wolf, and many others that they're working with went one step further. Those first zero, one, and two are already there in Holman's Feebach, and then they added. Uh, nurture identities. In fact, they went in even further and added ghosts and anti ghosts and all that good stuff. In any case, the classical BV complex provides precisely such a differential graded algebra. So, hey, now in physics, you're used to using an action principle. I was not, so it took me a while to realized that adding a suitable inner product was very important. And this led to what is now called a cyclic L infinity algebra, meaning you can cyclically permute the variables and you get this relation af after applying the inner product. More recently, Chirish Geotopoulos, oops, Richard, my apologies, there's supposed to be a space after your name, Shabo, have added another twist, namely an analog of a Drinfeld braiding. Now, on the other hand, when there was this issue of creating L infinity structures. And there's this term now very prevalent, even in other parts of theoretical physics called bootstrapping. The image being, of course, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's a process in this case, which starts with a known theory and some additional data, and then creates a deformation by inductively solving the L infinity relations to get the whole structure. For example, you could start a deformation using the star commutator, or formerly just a Poisson bracket. Now, in addition to the now familiar pattern of field dependent gauge transformations, crucially, there's also a, a, an assumption that they're in a situation where closed implies exact. In other words, that it's something homotopically trivial. This, raise, this is easy enough in the case where you're working just on Rn or a uh, open coordinate chart in a manifold, but I'm not sure anybody has really worked out the globalization problem. Okay. Five minutes. Oh.
Okay, so there's this other thing that's appeared in physics in the last couple of years, namely tensor hierarchies. From a mathematical point of view, they look very much like a Posnikov tower or a Sullivan, Sullivan model, if either of those mean anything to you. The surprise to me is that they arise from Leibniz algebras. I'm still not clear on what in supergravity provoked attention to Leibniz algebras. By the way, they were named by uh, Jean-Louis Laudet, who refused to have them called Laudet algebras. In fact, there's an earlier incarnation due to Bloch. So, a Leibniz algebra has a binary operation which satisfies the left der derivation rule, but with no sym symmetry assumption, so Jacobi fails. Several papers indicate a Leibniz algebra gives rise to a tensor hierarchy and then to an L infinity algebra, basically by lifting adjoining additional variables to, to compensate for the failure of De Jacobi, repeating that pattern we've seen several times already. Now we want to talk briefly about L infinity connections and twisted tensor products. More Cartan has become the label du jour. Earlier, it was, the same formula was called the integrability condition for deformation theory. It's also known as the master equation for field theory, flatness of a connection, and even the very definition of a twisting cochain. That's supposed to be read as the L infinity version, more infinity version of more Cartan is just instead of having dA equals a bracket a, you use all the brackets. Now, what I want to talk about is some very recent work of Bonetzi and Olaf Holm, an algebraic model for a vibration. These, you already have access to this side, so let me highlight the few things and not waste too much time reading the whole thing. You start with a tensor product with the obvious differential on each of the two terms, but then you twist it by adding this additional term. Venezia and Holm have just such an example, though they don't say so. The interesting thing about it is they start with a covariant derivative. If it's not flat, then they flatten the curvature by successively using the higher brackets. You all know where the expression flatten the curve comes from. Thank you. <laughs> Following the work of Gersenhaber, introducing algebraic deformation theory, it was applied to quantization by those five, otherwise known as the buffaloes. And by the way, by going to algebraic deformation theory, it means forget your Hilbert spaces and pay attention to cohomological physics. So here very briefly is Gersten Haber's algebraic deformation theory. You start with a binary operation. You add a first order term, which you want to be associative modulo T squared. At that point, Gersnaba realized that it was the Hochschild cohomology class that mattered. A formal deformation is what you might expect. It's just a formal power series with these higher order terms. And again, it can all be expressed in terms of higher structure on the Hochschild cochain complex. Given a choice of M1, there may or may not be a suitable M2. Gersten Haber's now eponymous bracket, which looks just like the Scout and Nyhaus bracket of multi-vector fields. Notice like that, it doesn't go from two to, and two to four, it goes to H, H3. There's that shift in degree again, uh, which some people call an odd Poisson bracket. The primary obstruction to extending 
is given by the Gerstenhaber bracket. That is, there exists an M2 if and only if the Gerstenhaber bracket vanishes. Notice the typeface on the M1, that's now at the cohomology level, crucially. <clears throat> if the primary obstruction vanishes, then there's a secondary obstruction and so forth and so on, always in subquotients of HH3. This was originally seen in complex structures in work of Dwadi. There's also a notice, who also noticed the relation to a massive product, uh, another object that shows up very commonly in A infinity discussions. Finally, work in progress with uh, Vladislav Kuprianov for a Poisson manifold you can construct a Poisson bracket using a bivector by the usual coordinate formula, which you notice I do not mention, but also as a derived bracket, a intriguing new way, well, fairly new way of describing a lot of structures. The key requirement corresponding to Jacobi is precisely the theta theta brackets to zero. Okay, where am I? There we go. So Kuprianov introduced the notion of a quasi Poisson bracket given by an arbitrary bivector. Since it may not satisfy that condition, we seek to deform it. Our approach is to follow basically the BFB procedure. I won't read that, but I'd like to conclude my talk with reference to a mentor of mine. Yuri Reinich, notice in 1923, he indicated that, oh, read it for yourself, I won't rub it in. He tried again in 1950, but unfortunately, apparently nobody listened. To say it more informally, which is I think the way I heard it from him, the last thing you want to do is write it in coordinates. That is know the object, understand it, Finally, when you need to get a number out, sure, then use coordinates. And finally, I guess I have to escape from this and hope it's there. Here he is. That's Yuri Reinich as I knew him. By the way, if you don't know the name, read volume 15 of the Einstein Correspondence. Yuri was enough of a mathematical relativist that he had extensive correspondence with Einstein. Remember, Einstein said he didn't do much mathematics. Okay, that's it. I think I made my time limit. Two minutes All to go. Right. <laughs> very good. Thanks uh, very much, Jim, for this uh, uh, big... Uh, view of the whole field and uh, including all these recent works that have been going on in the last couple of years. So uh, do we have um, comments from other speakers, from others, uh, questions for Jim? Any? Whoops. Any other things? Um, Oh, I, I should. Uh, I wanted to add uh, that I remember sure. well this uh, visit to UNC when I first uh, show you some closed string field theory results, and uh, uh, Jim's excitement was uh, manifest and was a big role in uh, trying to for me to advance these results. And uh, his quote of Reinich, uh, it always uh, resonates with me when. Uh, well, mostly mathematicians just don't quite see the point of this with an associative vertex and homotopy associative is all that matters. So uh, <laughs> just um, it, it makes the point and in fact the, all the structures we've been seeing today really homotopy structures uh, are the key of every development. So uh, somebody else uh, wants to make a comment or Ask a question, yes. we're exactly at noon. Uh, yes, can I make a comment? 
please go ahead. Uh, uh, it seems this infinity or your infinity comes naturally if you have a cutoff. If you have a excuse cutoff. Me, excuse me, it comes naturally with what? Uh, from the uh, cutoff. Oh, cutoff. Uh huh. Cut off. Yes. Uh, if you have a cutoff, then the space of functions you lose uh, associativity. Ah, good point. I hadn't looked at it that way. <laughs> yes. So you they use this uh, infinite structure to rescue. Right. The, uh, inf uh, associativity. So up to high uh, homotopy. You know. So yes. maybe it's, it's also high in a rational homotopy theory. They use rational differential forms. It's kind of cut off. Yeah. The analogous thing, it's similar. I'm not saying it's the same. Is that if you have even a strictly associative algebra, uh, differential graded algebra, and you pass mm -hmm. to its homology, the result looks like an associative algebra, of course, but it turns out there are higher order terms hiding. So in fact, you're this minimal model has an A-infinity structure. I think we had one reference to that earlier this morning, the work of Kadishvili. But I hadn't thought about it in terms of cutoff. My problem is I don't speak physics fluently. By the way, if any of you care to follow up on any of these topics, I'd be more than happy to discuss them with you. Uh, let me know about your papers. I didn't put in all the references. There was some time, but I intend to do so in a further version, and then I'll write the whole thing up as a paper, I hope. But any feedback, any discussion, any complaints are most welcome. And I think we're out of time. Yeah. Um, well, very good. Uh, it's time to thank all of our uh, speakers uh, today. We can uh, unmute ourselves and clap a little. And Um, thanks uh, for listening in. Uh, this uh, concludes our uh, Monday session for the conference. We'll be prompt uh, and ready to restart tomorrow, Tuesday, um, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, 9 a.m. Brazil Time, and other times all over the world. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.